Hello and welcome back guys. Glad to see you around. Make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. This is Book of the Dead. Chapter 161. Fucking shit. No matter what he tried, Dove was unable to get the Unseen to acknowledge him. He performed the status ritual over and over again, but nothing happened. He pressed his hand, his skeletal hand, to the paper and enacted the ritual. But where once he would have felt the blood flow from his finger and onto the page, now he felt nothing. He didn't have blood, that much was understood. He was as dry as a slayer's balls two hours back from a rift. Strictly speaking, not a single part of his current body was, or had been at any time, organic. He was a statue carved in the likeness of a skeleton, not actual bones. So even the potential for blood had never existed in him. It was difficult to explain. Having something that had been an intrinsic part of him just not work was maddening. It hadn't bothered him as much when he was just a skull. But now that he could move, could cast magic, he wanted it back. He wanted it back so badly it was like a dog gnawing on what was left of his abused soul. The onyx skeleton gripped the paper tight, ripping it along the edges. Haven't I done enough for you? Fucking son of a bitch. He growled. I fought the kin. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that why you came to this fucking world? Help me. Of course. It didn't answer him. The people of the Empire hadn't called it the Unseen for thousands of years. Because it had a habit of making itself known. Filled with disgust, he threw the sheet down to the forest floor. An all too familiar despair welled up in him, like an old friend come to smother him once again. Dove chuckled bitterly. Feeling sorry for himself had become a favorite pastime of his over the last few years. It was almost his natural state of being. Unlike the past, he refused to let it take hold of him anymore. Wallowing in pity wasn't his style. Wallowing in other things definitely, just not pity. If he was forced to exist in this god's riddled world, then he would find a way to fucking thrive. Dove was not some vampire's plaything. There had to be a way. There had to be. But what was it? The status ritual had existed in its current form for, who knew how fucking long. Kids learned it at the age of three. All that was needed was some words, and a smidge of finger dexterity. The most basic piece of magic, so trivial it didn't even appear on the status sheet it created. That ritual wouldn't work for him, he knew that now. Communicating the information of the unseen through blood couldn't work. He had no blood, so he needed a new medium. In the distance, he could hear skeletons fighting in the dark, and briefly considered going to help. The small container of magic he contained was refilled now, and his undead vision was equally as mediocre during the night as the day. But he didn't bother. If he couldn't summon the unseen, get a class and levels, then there wasn't much point in killing the kin. How am I supposed to come up with a new status ritual out of the blue? How? With what? He spat into the frozen night air. Tyron could probably do it. The fucking kid was a once-in-a-generation genius, the likes of which Dove had never seen. He piled up mysteries like other people piled up hangovers. No matter how much magic he managed to pull out of his backside, there always seemed to be more in there. If anyone could figure out how to recreate literally the oldest ritual known to man, it was that smug prick. But Dove didn't want to ask him. He was done going begging, cap in hand to Tyron, and hoping the necromancer could fix his problems for him. Except no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't come with even a way to begin trying to construct a status ritual. Dove was a good mage, possibly even an excellent one, but there was an enormous difference between proficient rule following and creating new rules from nothing. Give him a complete set of sigils, and Dove could perform the spell, break down the meaning of the individual components, even suggest improvements or modifications. But creating something from scratch, it was an entirely different matter. Fuck. Frustrated, he kicked a loose rock, sending the stone flying out into the darkness, then growled in frustration when he noticed he'd cracked his own toe. Just perfect. Irritated, angry, frustrated and gloomy, Dove turned his back on the night and trudged towards Tyron's cozy little cave, wishing he had some pockets he could shove his hands into. One couldn't satisfactorily trudge while swinging their hands like a farmer in a fucking field at festival time. He brushed aside the heavy blanket covering the opening, light and presumably warmth washing over him as he did so. Hey, kid he began a little awkwardly, then stilled. Tyron looked utterly insane. Hunched over that ridiculous table, eyes half bulging out his head, he was scribbling away in his book at a furious pace, whispering and muttering to himself, eyes glazed over and almost drooling. Fucking hell. Dove exclaimed, wondering what had possessed him. 
but it didn't take long to realize what was going on. Inspiration had struck once again, and the necromancer was lost in his own mind. Despite the outburst, Tyron didn't flinch. If anything, he only grew more feverish as the moments ticked by. Dove sighed. Without physically tackling him to the ground, it was unlikely he'd get any help from his erstwhile protege for the time being. Instead of forcing the issue, he decided to fold his bony legs, pull out his own notes, and try to work on a resolution to his status problem. With a little luck, some of the genius aura sparkling around the fucking kid would trickle his way. By the time he realized time had passed, it was already morning. Tyron blinked wearily, his entire body aching as he stretched and groaned. Being hunched over the table for 10 hours straight hadn't been kind to his muscles. Thank the abyss he was as durable as he was, or it would have been far, far worse. Hands trembling slightly, he reached out to the pages in front of him, flicking through them, as his eyes quickly scanned the sigils and patterns scrawled on each. The longer he looked, the more confident he became. It could work. It would work. A broad grin split his face as he stood, the pages still clutched in his hands. A ritual on this scale it was mind-boggling far beyond anything he'd attempted before. He couldn't wait to make the attempt. Slow your roll, Dick had a dry voice echoed through the small cave. Tyron turned to see Dove curled up into a little ball of bones leaning against a rock wall, his own book open across his knees, pen in hand. Blood and bone. I didn't see you there. I'm sneaky. But aside from that, you'd better hold your horses for a second and take a few breaths. What do you mean? Tyron frowned. What do you mean? Dove mocked him. I can see it plain as day. It's written all over your face. You've worked out some stupid bullshit, and now you want to run out and try it immediately. It's not stupid and I got it from leveling up. I didn't figure it out myself. The skeleton leaned to the side and cupped its cheek on one hand, again, a disturbingly human gesture. Interesting, so it must be some kind of spell or ritual. A big one. Tyron's eyes brightened. It's a ritual he enthused, and it's insane. Have a look at these sigil patterns and tell me if you've ever seen anything like it. As he rushed forward with the book extended, the skeleton held up a hand to stop him in his tracks. No. Go wash. Eat something. Drink some water and put on some clean fucking clothes. What would your mother say if you tried to cast a complex ritual for the first time in this kind of state? She'd be appalled. Tyron took a deep breath, then nodded begrudgingly. Fine, he muttered, then turned to leave. Put the book down, Dove called. The young mage looked down to see the book of notes still clutched tightly to his chest. With extreme reluctance, he placed it down on the table, each finger lingering on the cover as if bound there with glue. With a final, monumental effort of will, he dragged himself away, almost throwing himself outside of the cave as he brushed aside the blanket covering. He blinked. What were all these people doing here? Not many, perhaps a dozen. They looked up at him, gathered in a small cluster about 20 meters down the hill. He looked down at them, suddenly wondering if he still had drool on his chin. H hello, he said hesitantly. The villagers, which is what he presumed they were, clapped their hands together and bowed at the waist towards him. Were they followers of the old gods? That made the most sense. Suddenly wary, Tyron watched them cautious of what they may do or say. Would they demand protection of him, as their gods had promised? Apparently not. Rather than say anything at all, the group turned on their heels and left, filing back down the mountain towards Cragwhistle in silence, leaving Tyron wondering just what had happened. He shook himself. He didn't have time for this. There was magic to be about. As quickly as he could, he washed himself using the soap and water enchanted core he purchased for the trip, before putting on fresh clothes, ripping into a breakfast of bread, cheese and a little fruit, before he staggered back into the cave, still choking down the last of the loaf. Grove, he exclaimed through a mouthful of food. You fucking idiot. Dove. He tried again, after swallowing. Come on, look at this, you won't believe it. Almost against his will, the skeleton allowed himself to be pulled to the table where Tyron began to flick through the pages, excitedly explaining the sigils and patterns within. Despite himself, Dove felt himself being drawn in. It was interesting. This is dimensional magic he muttered, reaching out a finger to trace across the page. This section here this is forging a connection with another realm. Not just creating a connection Tyron enthused. Look here, what do you make of this? If Dove was capable of frowning, he would. This he trailed off. This was something different. 
He himself was quite capable at dimension magic, considering his former class had involved bringing sentient beings from the astral sea to this realm. It was to be expected. But these sigils this was a type of magic he hadn't seen before. I don't believe these sigils are forming connections. I know how to identify a destination and reach for it. This is more like creation. Tyron slapped a hand down on the table exuberantly. That's right. If I'm not mistaken, and I don't think I am, this ritual creates and connects to a location. The amount of magic required to do something like that would be absurd. Making a a what? Out of what? Where would you be making it? Dove asked some very reasonable questions. An Oswari, out of magic, somewhere came the replies. A a what what in the name of fuck is an Oswari? It's a resting place of human remains, usually a building. We don't see them much these days. But I'm told worshippers of rot used to store their dead in ossuaries, letting the flesh, well, rot until only the bones remained. Supposedly, there are thousands and thousands of skeletons stored in them the necromancer side, wistful. Sadly, nobody knows where they are. Dove poked him in the arm. How are you an expert of these places all of a sudden? It's the name of my new class. Didn't I tell you, Lord of the Oswari? Maybe you did. I'm not sure. Must be a hell of a class to start with a ritual like this. He tapped his finger on the page. I'm assuming this was level 42. Tyron nodded confirmation, and Dove tried to whistle before remembering he couldn't. Fuck. Well, if you're going to do this thing, close to the rift like we are here is a good spot. Plenty of ambient magic to soak up but I'd make sure your ritual site is carefully prepared, and your mediums are well in place before you utter a single word. Tyron struggled not to roll his eyes, but he couldn't argue with any of the advice. With a slight smile, he turned to his packs and began to rummage through them, emerging with a long staff that he held gently in both hands. What in the name of shit? Dove exclaimed. That's beautiful. Where did you get that from? Tyron ran his hands along the intricately carved wood. It was a gift from my mother. She planned to give it to me after my awakening. My father got me a sword as well. He was always an optimist. Dove approached and cooed over the fine construction of the mage staff. Holy shit. That's nice. That is. Look at the enchanting work done on it. What did they put into this thing? It practically shines with magic, I can see it even with my ass backwards skeleton eyes. Mages would often mock the martial classes for their obsession with weapons. Swordsmen and women never shut up about their blades, would sleep with the damn things if they had half a chance. But truth was, mages were just as bad when it came to two things. Ritual foci and staves. A good staff was a magic amplifier, a ritual focus and a handy stick to whack things with all at the same time. Everything the aspiring mage needed. However, getting a good one was more expensive than most practitioners of the craft could justify. What Tyron held in his hands was top shelf. In fact, it was more than that. This wasn't something you could buy off the shelf. A staff like this would only be made on commission, and only if you supplied the materials yourself, because you couldn't buy what wasn't on the market. They bought you this for your awakening. Dove choked out. That's absurd. If Beery herself had a staff any better than this, I'll eat my own femur. Tyron shrugged and didn't reply. That was what they were like. Grand gestures weren't uncommon from his parents, but they typically weren't this grand. I've been looking for an excuse to use it. This seems like a great time. He grasped hold of the staff firmly, a bright light sparking in his eyes. Time to do some magic. Chapter 162 Tyron didn't need Dove's prodding to ensure he was fully prepared to cast this absurdly complex ritual. But that didn't seem to stop the skeleton trap soul. He nitpicked about everything, questioning the young mage three times about every little detail. Was the circle correct? Was it actually correct? How stable were the components used to draw it? Did he realize that drawing the circle with your finger and dust is a fucking stupid idea? Had he double-checked his notes and ironed out all the wrinkles? What focus was he using? Was it suitable? Had he checked it was suitable? And on, and on, and on. It was incredibly frustrating. Tyron didn't particularly want to say it. But he knew he was a better mage than Dove. Yet he allowed himself to be drawn into arguments over and over again, defending his choices, proving his work, and covering each little detail to his mentor's satisfaction. Dove managed to drag the process out so long. 
It was two days after their first conversation in the cave, when he was finally prepared to cast the ritual. Which was entirely the point. The former summoner had delayed as much as he could, force Tyron to rethink each aspect of the ritual, until the version he was about to cast was vastly superior to what he'd held in his hands two days ago. In all that time, Tyron's undead had continued to intercept and destroy the Rivkin descending the mountain, collecting their cores and depositing them just outside the cave. They also kept away the villagers who, for some reason, continued to emerge from Kragrasil to catch a glimpse of the necromancer, bowing to him if they happened to see him, bowing to the skeletons if they didn't. Which, thanks to Minion's sight, Tyron also frequently saw. Standing over the wide, flat rock Tyron had engraved his circle on. He sighed with satisfaction. It was perfect. Each line, loop and wall, every symbol of arcane power, was without flaw. Which they needed to be if he didn't want to have the entire thing blow up and kill him. This ritual demanded so much magic, so much power, even the slightest mistake would cause it to backfire with spectacular results. Dove he said, I've wanted to kill you so many times over the last few days. But as much as it pains me to say it, thanks. You've helped a lot. The skeleton shrugged his onyx shoulder bones and chattered his teeth, an annoying habit he picked up. You've got one major flaw when it comes to magic, kid. You're too damn good. Sometimes, you don't seem to believe it's even possible for you to make a mistake. I didn't Tyron pointed out defensively. All of my work was correct. But it wasn't complete. You were rushing and you know it. Casting rays dead the day after you learned it is fucking crazy enough. A ritual of this size. That's straight up insane asylum material. And I would know. Why are you making me argue with you? I was in the process of thanking you. I have an argumentative personality. Well shut the fuck up. I'm ready to begin. As you say. And when I'm done, I'll work on developing a status ritual for you. The skeleton stood still, dumbstruck, for once. Why you will? Do you have a lead on one? Tyron nodded, a sly grin crossing his face. What? You don't. Eat a sack of dicks. Ah, uh, if you keep talking, I might change my mind. Dove mind locking up his jaw, then dropping the key into his imaginary trousers. If you can help keep the villagers away, though, that would be great. I have skeletons positioned along the path, but not that many. The vast bulk of his forces were on the mountain, with the rest positioned around the ritual site for protection. At all times, at least 20 skeletons and two of his revenants remained with him. But he was much more comfortable when that number was close to 50. If the slayers in town teamed up to attack, he had to have at least that many. Thanks to Alton, he knew that, at this moment in time, such an attack wasn't very likely. Unable to talk, thanks to the locking mechanism he put in place, Dove gave him a double thumbs up before he turned on his heel, and bounced his way down the mountain path, almost skipping. Tyron shook his head and turned back to his circle, steadying his breathing. For the final time, he checked to ensure he had everything he needed. In his right hand, he gripped the staff his mother had prepared for him. It was still too powerful for him to handle in battle, but as a ritual focus, it would serve him well. On his left hip rested a pouch, the string pulled to reveal the five shards of mage candy contained inside. At his current constitution and tolerance, five was pushing his limits, and hopefully he wouldn't need them all. There were several charged cores sewn into his robes, power arrays that he could draw magic from, but each one contained less than a fifth of the energy in a single piece of candy. Satisfied that everything was as ready as it could be, Tyron planted the staff in the groove he had prepared in front of him, raised his hands, and began to speak. Mage tongue. The words of power slammed into the air, each syllable a hammer blow that Tyron used to shape reality itself. At his current level of mastery, with the backing of his mysteries, his ability to draw out the full strength of each word was at its peak. Magic flowed out of him through the staff, which began to resonate with power then out and into the circle. Tyron's hands wove through graceful and deliberate motions, unhurried, forming one sigil, then the next, as he moved through the opening phase of the ritual. It wasn't complicated, this part, all he had to do was gather power, but he needed so much. The circle drank in every drop of magic he could give it, the line slowly emitting a soft glow that grew stronger with each passing moment. But it still wasn't enough. More. With his words, Tyron continued to pull in more magic, then force it out into the circle. He drained the reserves in his cloak within the first five minutes, choosing to take them early, 
while he still had the attention to spare. Shortly after, he popped the first of his mage candy under his tongue, letting the arcane energy flow into him, and fuel his magic. After 15 minutes, the circle blazed with power. Ominous, dark purple light, the color of death magic, blinded him. But Tyron didn't need to see to continue the ritual. To him, nothing existed outside of the circle. Not the world, not the rifts, not his vengeance, nothing. There was only the ritual. Arms spread wide, Tyron brought them down. Then up again as he moved to the next phase. Five syllables, five cracks in the dimensional weave. He heard them even if there was nothing to see, as the fabric that held the realm together began to break in the air above the ritual circle. Now came the difficult part. Sweat began to drip from his forehead as Tyron used all his power and control to take hold of those cracks to mold and shape them. For what came next, they needed to be stable, needed to be mended without being closed. To an experienced dimension mage, this was their bread and butter, though perhaps not on the same scale. But to Tyron, this was close to uncharted territory. His throat already began to feel raw, his voice strained under the pressure. But he didn't falter, he had to continue. The second piece of mage candy went under his tongue as he let the crumbling remains of the first drop to his feet. His forehead was creased in concentration, his words and hands never ceasing their movement. This was a test of his control. If he took too long to stabilize the brakes, he would lose momentum and power, wasting the precious magic he had gathered before the real work had even begun. Twenty minutes later, he was finally satisfied. Darkness had crept in at the edges of his vision. But he wasn't sure if that was the fault of his eyes, or if the ritual itself were blurring the edges of reality. In this space above the circle, the boundary between this realm and others was now not only weakened, but punctured. The cracks had been reformed, shaped into something that vaguely resembled an arch, or perhaps a door. Here we go. The power had been gathered, the way had been opened, now it was time to move to the most important and most demanding step. Now it was time to create. Last Tyron said, his hands pushing outward from his chest. The ritual circle ignited, sending a shaft of purple light blazing into the sky. Like a dam breaking, a torrent of arcane power roared into the sky, the strength of it enough to vibrate the air. Tyron nearly staggered, almost driven to his knees by the strength of it, but steadied himself at the last moment. Sweat flowed freely now, running in rivulets down his face and into his eyes. To prevent distraction, he shut them. He had to focus. Once again, he began to speak rapidly now, words and sigils flashing from one to the next, as he sought to dig out a channel to guide the raging waters just a few steps in front of the frothing, crashing waves. All of that power, all of that energy, was gathered, directed and led straight into the arch, and then pushed, force beyond. The staff, standing before him, glowed bright with arcane light as it acted to enforce his will. An amplifier and defender all at once. It shielded him from the ravages of the gathered magic even as it aided him to enforce his will upon it. From down the mountain, Dove looked back over his shoulder as his soul quivered in response to the eruption of power. Through the trees, he could see it a column of purple light that extended hundreds of meters into the air. By the melons, he gasped. He'd known the ritual demanded a great deal of power, but he'd never expected the kid to try and pull in this much. Was he trying to get himself killed? For a moment, he hesitated, then growled and continued his journey down the path with increased haste. There was no point going back now. What could he do? The ritual had begun, and Tyron would either see it through or die in the attempt. Sure as shit there would be a heck of a lot of attention from Cragwasol, though, he had to make sure some idiot kid didn't run up and throw a rock at the necromancer's stupid head. In town, Autumn gaped at the light which had erupted up the mountain. Even during the day, the light seemed to darken around the edges, as if being pushed away from that column of light. Orthrus defend me he muttered absently, eyes still wide with shock. Around him, people rushed into the streets, pointing, murmuring, whispering. What had Tyron done? What was he doing? Wasn't he trying to lay low? From the corner of his eye, he saw the slayers gathering outside the barracks, faces grim as they talked amongst themselves. He couldn't read their body language. Were they fearful? Angry? What would they make of this? No matter what, Orton feared it wouldn't be good. Within the ritual circle, Tyron danced on the edge of oblivion, funneling the power through the rapidly forming arch and into the space beyond. As he did so, 
He formed it, shaped it, building, even though he didn't truly understand what he was making. In this, he was guided by the ritual, directed by the unseen. The pace continued to be high, words and sigils forming rapidly, words tripping from his tongue, as his hands flickered from one precise gesture to the next. Was he on his third shard of candy? Or the fourth? He couldn't remember. The ritual demanded more power, so more power he gave. This was the final phase, and Tyron raced to complete it, not wanting to waste a single drop of the magic he had gathered. From within the ritual circle, energy continued to thunder out and into the arch, taking shape on the other side as Tyron managed multiple processes at once. On and on it went, until his throat was red and raw, his entire body ate, and his spirit was gasping almost squeezed dry of the last of its magic. Even Tyron, with all of his endurance and fortitude, felt himself begin to waver as the ritual went on, well past an hour, and into the second. When finally it was done, he spoke the last word, formed the last sigil, and collapsed to his knees, hands shaking as he at last relinquished his iron control. Exhaustion crushed him as the light faded from the circle, yet still, a small, satisfied smile creased his lips. Before him stood a doorway, wedged in a frame of bones. Chapter 163 In the aftermath of the ritual, Tyron focused on recovering his breath as he massaged his aching hands. His throat felt raw, and his reserves of magic almost completely drained. The bitter tang of arcane crystal would linger on his tongue for a day or two. He'd definitely taken too much. He leaned to the side and spat the last of the mage candy onto the ground. There would be a lot of pain later but Tyron was confident he'd erred on the right side of his limitations. Before him, the crack in reality persisted, an arch of bone framing a black door, an ossuary. He was excited to learn what it was, but he didn't think he could get off his knees just yet. A few more minutes and he'd have recovered a little magic, and perhaps gathered the strength to fetch some water from his pack. By the divine teats. What the fuck was that, kid? Dove yelled as he ran up the slope. I was expecting a big ritual. But that was fucking ridiculous. I could see it all the way down the slope. You bet your ballsack they could see it in the village as well. If they weren't too intimidated, then I expect someone is going to come poking their nose into your business. The onyx skeleton stood looking at the arch that stood in the center of the ritual circle. Oh nice. You made a door. It's an ossuary he huffed between breaths. So you said... But you and I both know you haven't the foggiest idea what it does. The Unseen is notoriously stingy with details. And you don't have a class manual. It could be completely useless. Tyron grimaced as he forced himself to his feet. Despite a little waver, he managed not to fall, and began to stagger to his nearby pack. Even if it's useless now, this is the first ability I gained with my class. I don't doubt there are feats and other spells, possibly even more rituals that I can learn to develop it further. Then shouldn't you have waited before rushing ahead to cast this? Dove pointed out. The necromancer allowed himself a slight smile. I probably should have he admitted after taking a cautious sip from his water skin. Blood and bone, his throat was sore. I just couldn't bring myself to resist. The lure of new magic was too strong for him. He could admit that especially such an intricate and interesting ritual as this one. Perhaps he'd cut off his own toe, rushing into it so quickly, without fully understanding how the class was going to develop. But Tyron was satisfied after everything he'd put into it. His ritual would be useful down the line, no matter what. How long is it going to stay there? Dove wondered, staring at the door. Is it permanent? Of course not Tyron scoffed. It'll vanish once the circle is disrupted or runs out of power. It's barely pulling in enough to keep the entrance manifested. I'm assuming you can also dismiss it. Of course. Right. The skeleton circled around the arch, humming in appreciation as he went. I saw a gate into the astral sea once. You know he called as he reached the far side. It looked a shitload more impressive than this. Bigger? and much more colorful. This thing is depressing. Isn't the astral sea impossible to traverse? Tyron asked. Why would anyone want a gate that goes there? It might be impossible to traverse for weak pieces of shit like you and me, but that doesn't mean that's the case for everyone. Huh. After another minute of rest, Tyron finally felt well enough to approach the entrance, nerves beginning to stir. Now that the rush of completing the spell had faded, he hoped Dove wasn't right. It would feel like such a waste if he'd gone to all this effort and created something he couldn't even use. Directly above the door, dead center of the arch, a human skull sat, 
looking down on him as he approached. An interesting detail, he didn't think he saw any other skulls as part of the myriad bones that made up the arch. After considering it for a moment, Tyron stepped forward and pushed open the door. There was a hint of resistance, and then the black wood swung soundlessly, cold, still air wafting through the opening. Oh, that's creepy as shit. Dove, can you shut up for a minute? Fine. It was dark on the other side, but Tyron could make out a stone floor. Grooves carved into the surface trailing away into the shadows. With a gesture, he conjured a globe of light and held it in his palm, wincing as even this insignificant drawer of magic taxed his body. With the softly glowing sphere in hand, he stepped through the door and into the other side. Dove shouted a warning which cut off suddenly, causing Tyron to spin and see the door close soundlessly behind him. Just like that, the mountain was gone, and he was here on his own. I can open it again. Probably. He reassured himself. The arch was present on this side as well. But instead of appearing from thin air, it was set into the stone wall. Tyron raised his gaze, holding the globe up over his head, until he caught sight of the vaulted ceiling overhead. To think that his magic had created all this. Did Tyron know how to turn arcane energy into stone? No, he didn't, but the ritual itself contained the pattern of this space's creation. He'd been required to gather the power, supply it and follow the intended design. But even so, the act of creation left him speechless. There were a few things he could tell about the Oswari already. The air inside was thick with death magic, drenched in it. Yet there didn't appear to be any source for it. With his left hand on the wall, he began to walk around the edge of the room until he came to the corner. The wall in front of him was different from that to his left. Instead of flat stone, it was filled with recesses, longer than they were high. A depressingly short amount of time passed before he realized they were for holding remains. Perhaps a normal person would have taken longer, but he could judge the length of a skeleton by eye quite easily at this point. Tracing along this new wall, he counted how many of these recessed areas there were. They were organized in columns of four, the lowest to the ground starting around ankle height, the highest starting at eye level. The room was long, surprisingly long, and he counted 25 columns before he reached the back wall. There was room for a hundred skeletons on that wall. He quickly strode over and confirmed the wall on the other side was the same. Only the front and back walls were flat and unadorned. So there was room for 200 skeletons within the ossuary. But what did that mean? Did these spaces provide some sort of benefit to the remains placed within? Could they empower the raised dead ritual in some way? Instinctually, Tyron could tell they did something. The air was too thick with magic for it to be otherwise. Given a little time, remains placed in here would get up and start wandering about on their own. Inspection of the side walls completed, Tyron began to wander down the middle, or as close to it as he could tell, his light didn't quite reach both sides. The room was 10 maybe 15 meters wide, and more than double that in length. Certainly a large area to have conjured out of thin air. Another question that came to mind was, where was this place? Neither Tyron nor Dove were competent enough dimension mages to precisely identify the target of the ritual. But Tyron had a suspicion he knew roughly where it was. The clues he'd been given by the abyss hinted as much, though he tried not to think of it. That was a price he had yet to pay. Distracted, he almost walked into the altar before he stopped at the last second, one hand extended forward to catch himself against the stone edge. Waist high, flat and undecorated, it was similar in dimensions to the recesses on the walls. Large enough to lay a body atop its surface, with room to spare. The altar itself wasn't what caught his attention, though what was beneath the altar was far more interesting. Tyron crouched down and brought the light close to the stone base. There was a gap, just wide enough to poke a finger into, between the base of the altar and the floor of the ossuary. Too narrow and too deep to see into, Tyron circled around, tracing the gap with one hand, until he completed a full circle of the altar. It went all the way around. Was the altar itself even connected to the rest of the room? Hard to tell. What was more concerning, was that now he had identified the source of the death magic. Dense and rich, it rose up through that little gap like a miasma before dissipating around the room. Tyron's head thudded in his chest and licked his dry lips as he gazed down at the floor. The death-aligned energy was rising into this room from somewhere below. What was down there? What could possibly be the source of such thick death magic? Did he really want to find out? The whispers of the abyss echoed in his mind once more, and Tyron wasn't sure if he hoped they were wrong, or they were right. 
Trinan clenched his jaw and stared Bridget straight in the eye, while she stared back at him, defiant. You know damn well we don't stand a chance if we go up against that necromancer he tried to reason with her. Last time, you didn't even get to swing your damn sword. Now is not the time to go herring up the mountain. Reasoning with Bridget never went well. She was stubborn as a mule, once an idea popped into her head. He thought it might be because her head was usually empty that, when it did finally have any thoughts, it held onto them come hell or high water. The villagers are terrified. Someone should go and make sure that the mountain is safe. For all we know, the necromancer just died in whatever that was, and the rift is undefended. If the king come rampaging down here in an hour, hacking and killing, do you really want that on your conscience? Trinan's instinct was to retort, but he had to bite his tongue as he considered what she said. Fucking idiot actually had a point. I swear by the gods, Bridget, the only time you say anything smart. It's to get yourself into danger, not out of it. She grinned at him. So we're going then. In one bound, she leapt to the side table where she kept her gear and began to buckle on her scabbard and leather armor. You want me to get the others? She said over her shoulder as she wrestled with the straps. No, he replied shortly. It'll just be you and me. If it's just Ken up there, the two of us can make it back safe. If we piss off the necromancer, at least you and I will be the only ones serving an eternity in death. The very thought of it chilled his heart, but Trinan took his duty seriously. He was on this mountain to kill Kin and keep people safe. Good point, the swordswoman replied. Are you going to get ready? Her team leader pulled his coat open to reveal he was wearing his armor underneath. I'm always ready. They were spotted on the way out, because of course they were. Bridget made enough noise for a parade when she wanted to. Turns out it didn't matter much, none of the other teams were all that keen to join them. Gramble had apparently gone running to see the Magister once the magic had lit up the sky. If he'd been there, Trinan would have told him not to bother. He tried talking to the man the day before. It hadn't gone well. Don't think about it, idiot. If you start to think your own mind is going to get messed with, you'll never make it up the slope. For her part, Bridget seemed unusually determined. Once they were out of the gate, she strode up the mountain, her expression and shoulders set. Whatever the reason, Trinan was glad to see a rare glimpse of her taking the job seriously. She coasted on her talent far too much for his liking. Stay sharp, he reminded her. There could be kin anywhere. If we run into a big group, we run back to the village, not fight a stupid battle. Got it. Of course, she said. After they continued to trek up the slope, they eventually came to a group of skeletons standing astride the path. Silent and still, they watched the two slayers approach with purple flame burning in their eyes. Only six of them, an unusually small number, though he supposed it made sense. The mage wasn't worried about being attacked from this direction. He heard Bridget's knuckles crack as she tightened her grip around the hilt of her sword. In one bound, he was by her side, hand pressing firmly down on the pommel. Bridget, he murmured softly, are you trying to get yourself fucking killed? Because if you are, you didn't need to convince me to come along to die alongside you, right? There's only six of them, she hissed back, glaring at the undead. There are hundreds more, and you fucking know that. Get your hands off your damn weapon. The last was forced through gritted teeth as he tried to force some sense into his teammate. To his relief, she finally relaxed and withdrew her hand. Now stand behind me and don't do anything stupid, he warned her, then stepped forward, hands raised towards the skeletons. The undead hadn't moved during their exchange and remained as they had been, watching. I'd uh, like to talk to the necromancer, presuming he's still alive. He must be, if the undead was still fine, he supposed. Why was he talking to the damn bones anyway? Could they even speak back? One of them had, but Trinan felt that particular skeleton was unique. Silently, the skeletons parted, seemingly giving permission for the two slayers to pass through. Nervous, Trinan led the way, glaring back at Bridget every few steps, just to make sure she wasn't being stupid. When they came to a relatively flat clearing, they saw him. Trinan caught a glimpse of something, a doorway of some kind, fading to nothing. Before the mage turned to face them, eyes narrowed. My first guests in a while the mage rasped, then coughed. I presume you have questions. Chapter 164 Trinan tried not to feel intimidated in the presence of the necromancer. Without his armor, he didn't look nearly as large, but with so many undead. Watching silently, it was unnerving being in his presence. W. We wanted to see what was happening after the, the spell. 
Fucking hell. Don't stumble over your words like a damned weakling. If the mage noticed, he didn't say anything. Rather, he nodded his head in understanding. I was told the ritual was visible for quieter ways. It's not surprising people would want to know what was going on. As he spoke, the mage rubbed at his throat clearly uncomfortable. There was a rough quality to his voice, as if he'd been shouting. Come and sit, he said and walked a little unsteadily toward a nearby rock. Trinan tensed. Was he weak? Perhaps the spell had taken a lot out of him, leaving him worn and drained. Without looking, he reached behind and grabbed hold of Bridget's wrist. Before she could do something stupid. You two sit over there the necromancer indicated. No need to let you get too close now, is there? I suppose not Trinan said evenly, nudging his swordswoman unsubtly toward a stone. For some reason, the mage found this amusing, a slight smile creasing his lips. I am weakened he admitted openly, watching the pair of bronze slayers with dark eyes. The ritual drained almost all of my magic, and will leave me sickened for several days. But each moment that passes, I gain a little more strength. The leaders of the hooligans tried not to react, though he heard Bridget grunt. Why would you admit that to us? She snapped, unable to contain the outburst. It's like you're trying to bait us into attacking you. The necromancer grinned, but there was little humor in it. That might well be the case. I have created a new toy, but to properly play with it, I need the correct materials. I was wondering if you two were going to volunteer. Trinan firmly crossed his arms over his chest, making no move to reach for his weapons. If she wants to be turned into a fucking skeleton, she's more than welcome to it. I'll be fine right here. Those cold eyes turned towards Bridget. Well, he asked. She grit her teeth and sat down next to her team leader. Hands clenched into fists by her side. For his part, the mage simply shrugged, then accepted a rat parcel handed to him by a skeleton. After opening it, he reached in and picked out some dried fruit which he popped into his mouth. Rehydrating after a long ritual is key. I found he said around the mouthful. Keeping your energy up and preventing damage to the throat. Even as tough as I am, it can still get caught out by it. Sounds rough Trennan spoke evenly, wondering to himself why this man would be speaking to them at all. What was he getting out of it? We wanted to confirm you were still in a right, already craving a little more experience. I was focused on the safety of the people in the village. Oh, you seem like you actually mean that the necromancer sounded surprised. An old school slayer. Keep the peace, protect the realm, defend the people. There aren't many around like that anymore. What would you know about slayers? Bridget ground out, still glaring up at the mage. You aren't anything like us. Not that I ever really had a chance to be the necromancer return mildly, a slightly puzzled expression on his face. He watched the swordswoman for a long moment, noting the anger on her face, the tension in her posture, her clenched fists. You really don't like me, he said, finally, which is understandable to a point. I defeated you in our first encounter, which can create a grudge. I'm sure. My class is illegal, which is another thing you can hold against me. But I feel like that would piss off someone like him. He indicated Trinan with a thumb, more than it would you. I'm monopolizing the rift, which is irritating. Sure, but only temporarily. I'm no threat to the village, as I'm certain you've gathered by now. He paused and chewed thoughtfully. No, I don't think any of those are the issue, not on their own. Why are you so angry with me? Is it the grave robbing? Bridget didn't reply, only sat in stony silence, quivering with suppressed emotion. Trinan couldn't help but ask a question. You actually rob graves? He asked distastefully. Not if I can help it. The vast majority of my minions were not sourced from cemeteries. I can say that much at least. So you object to desecrating graveyards? Of course, not the mage scowled. Who gives a shit what happens to your body after you've died? Ridiculous notion. No, I avoid it because disturbed graves will make any villager with half an intelligence point scream necromancer at the top of their lungs. That's interesting. He'd wanted to say disgusting, but managed to hold it in. The necromancer smiled, indicating he knew full well how Trinan felt about him. You should be in a position, more than most, to understand the value of my class, he said, pointing a finger in Trinan's direction. Look around you. A single person is holding off all the kin from this rift easily. How many of you are there in town? Ten. The only thing that needs to be sacrificed is the remains of the dead. Isn't that a worthy trade? It's difficult to argue that it's not Trinan shrugged. 
But, I don't think necromancers are illegal because of how ineffective they are. The opposite, more like, a single person able to control an army of undead. The mage nodded thoughtfully. You might have a point there. Certainly, there have been several examples throughout history of necromancers who have gotten out of control. Murdering innocent villagers, raising the bodies and marching on the next. He shrugged. You know as well as I do that any slayer could do the same. But we don't get stronger for doing it, Trenin growled. We have to fight the kin. You don't get experience for killing non-kin. First I've heard of it. There's another reason why the slayers don't harm innocent people, and we both know what it is. Trenin shifted uncomfortably. Bridget maintained her glare. You know about the brand? He asked hesitantly. I knew about it from a young age, more than most to be honest. My family was in the business. He shook his head as he chewed on another piece of fruit. Terrible thing, what it can do. Even the strongest slayers can be brought down to their knees by that thing. The pain is unimaginable, as I understand it. I'll never have to find out, Trinan said evenly. There's no reason for me to raise my weapon against an innocent. Not yet, the mage said. What do you think would happen if you tried to attack me? Both Trinan and Bridget stiffened. Fuck. I hadn't thought of that, he cursed himself, suddenly unsure. What would happen if he tried to cut down the man in front of him? The necromancer laughed. You hadn't even thought about it. I can tell you haven't been branded long. You think because I'm a bad guy, or evil in your eyes, that the brand can tell the difference. It's not as complex a tool as that. If you cut a single hair on my head, you'd be on the ground screaming without me having to lift a finger. Same thing goes if you wanted to attack a thief, or a bandit, a murderer or rapist. You're only allowed to be a deadly weapon because you can't direct it against anyone who isn't Rifkin. Not even to defend yourself with a few exceptions. He chewed thoughtfully as the two young slayers sat in silence. You ever wonder why the slayers live so separate from most people? They stay in the keeps, for the most part, when they aren't on expeditions. When they get too powerful and the magisters want to keep them close, they get shepherded into the Golden Quarter, a gilded cage. Why is that? Those cold eyes watched them carefully as he spoke. It's for protection. Most people think the people are being protected from the slayers, but the brand does that. No, it's to protect the slayers from the people. There are sick people out there, crazy fucking people, who all do unspeakable things to someone who can't fight back, someone powerful. He gave a short, harsh laugh, and then they wonder why slayers keep going rogue, blowing up and murdering people. Cutting down their own teammates in their sleep, carving through the populace until they can't push through the brand any longer, or they get cut down. Did they talk about that in your academy? The number of slayers who lose their minds. Trinan felt his mouth was suddenly dry. He'd never heard anything like this. That's not true he managed to force out, though he wished he sounded more convincing. The necromancer nodded sympathetically, which only pissed Trinan off. You've got no reason to take my word for it. Ask a silver-ranked slayer some time. They've had their brand upgraded and seen a few things around the traps. Once you've been at this for five or more years, if you're still alive, you'll be in that boat. So saying, the mage pushed himself to his feet with a sigh. Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate your concern for the people of the village. As you can see, things are under control. My skeletons are up the mountain as we speak, dealing with the kin. There shouldn't be any need for me to rely on your services. He paused. Though I'll keep you in mind should something dire arise. That was as clear a dismissal as Trinan had ever heard. Glad it was over without his soul being ripped out of his body. He stood and was pleased when Bridget stood up beside him. He was less pleased when she opened her mouth. I should apologize, she said. My hero died because of a necromancer. But that wasn't you, so I shouldn't be showing up with this attitude. Trinan turned to stare at his old friend, wide-eyed. Bridget apologized. What was this character growth? Some sort of breakthrough. And did it have to happen right fucking now, in front of this mage? If that was shocking... The necromancer throwing back his head and laughing was the icing on the cake. For the first time, Trinan thought there was genuine mirth in the man. Ah, shit. That took me by surprise the necromancer sighed. It's been so long since I laughed like that. Bridget was staring at him, murder written all over her face. And he quickly raised his hands. I don't mean any offense. Of course not. It's just the circumstances are a little unique. You're a swordswoman, correct? I am, Bridget confirmed, face still tight with anger. 
So, I'm guessing your hero was Magnin Steelum, platinum-ranked slayer, strongest of the eastern province. That's right, the necromancer grinned. In which case, there is no need for you to apologize. My father did indeed die because of me. You have the right man. He gave a short, polite bow. Allow me to introduce myself, Tyron Steelum, at your service. Was that really a good idea, kid? Dove asked after the two slayers had left. According to the Magisters, you're good and dead. Why give someone your name? Tyron snorted as he walked back towards the cave, still a little ginger. They're stuck up this mountain for years. Who are they going to tell? Even if they spread it around, who is going to believe them? The people in the damn village will deny everything if I ask them to. And once I'm done up here, what sign of me is going to remain? He really was weak. That ritual had taken more out of him than he'd thought. Or perhaps the side effects of the mage candy were kicking in early. Had he really taken so much just after he'd awakened? It was a miracle he'd survived. The next few days were going to be awful. But why take the risk at all? You could have just said, yeah, it sucks what that tyrant dickhead did. He's a stupid bitch who walks around with his head deep within his own asshole. An incredible piece of shit. If I ever met him, I would spit on his face for a good half hour. And then gotten on with your day. Tyron looked sideways at the onyx skeleton. I could have said all that. Huh. I can give you more. No thanks. Dove was right. He didn't have to reveal himself at all. Could have given them any fake name he wanted. Even now it wasn't too late. He could erase their memory of this meeting. Overwrite it with something different. But he knew he wouldn't. Ultimately. I think it's because I want the Slayers on my side Tyron's side. People like Trinan are the only thing that holds this place together. The only thing holding back the rifts from swallowing it all up. Magnan and Beery would have liked him. Someone like that? I want them on my side. Well, they are rent. If anything, you were deliberately making that girl angrier. Did you see the look on her face when she left? If looks could kill, I would be still dead. But she'll be back. They both will. Eventually, they are going to want the full story. And if I give it to them, there's a chance they might be on my side. For that chance. I'm willing to risk a lot. Why? For revenge Tyron said simply. Why else? No matter how powerful I get, having help people on the inside, who can work against the Magisters, will be invaluable. He brushed aside the blanket and held it so Dove could follow him into the cave. Now there's so much I need to think about. Developments with my class, advancing my abilities, everything I learned from Piranus. There's so much. Good thing I'm stuck here for a few more weeks. Chapter 165. There were many things that Gramble didn't understand in life. His mother, for one. The woman was a contradiction in terms. Low-born, but with the confidence and arrogance of a thrice-blessed noble. Perhaps it was that attitude that enabled her to snag his father, a retired silver slayer, looking to settle down and churn out potions for the rest of his days. After yelling, kicking, screaming and begging, he had finally been able to speak to the Magister, Granted a mere five minutes in his presence, and the change that had overcome the man beggared belief. From the moment Piranus arrived in Cragwhistle, he'd been a nightmare for everyone. He ran Gramble and every other Slayer ragged, filling in paperwork, counting, checking, double-checking, triple-checking. Interrogations were an almost weekly occurrence, where the grizzled mage would corner members of every team, hounding them with vague, cryptic threats, and asking leading questions. Instead of that demon, the man behind the desk had been passive. Not that Piranus was inactive, far from it. For the entire duration of the meeting, the Magister had been furiously filling out paperwork, his hands never stilling, blotches of ink on his face and sleeves, evidence of the furious pace he worked at. It was as if he was filing reports for the entire mountain, by himself, without any input from anyone else. With a chill, He'd eventually realized that was exactly what was happening. The necromancer had ensured that there would be no gap in the ceaseless reports that Piranus had sent back to the capital. The Roclaw, vicious, beat bastards that they were, continued to fly back and forth in a steady stream. As he tried to bring up the necromancer, tried to get a word in edgewise about him, Piranus had nearly exploded with rage, screaming, ranting and bellowing, his eyes bulging out of his head. He slammed his fist on the table and demanded Gramble stop wasting his time, threatening to throw him bodily from the room if he didn't get his fat ass out the door in four seconds. The whole meeting was incredibly unnerving, leaving the mage wide-eyed and trembling, 
fearing what that cursed necromancer would do if he ever decided to mess with his mind. If the Magister couldn't resist, what chance did he have? None at all. Miserable and afraid, he'd slumped his way back to the barracks, only to find Bridget and Trinan returning at the same time. A good man, and a good leader, Trinan would have been a natural representative for every team. If he wasn't as rigid as a rigor mortis ridden rat with a pole wedged up its ass. If the phrase by the book became sentient, lifted itself from the page and began walking around in human flesh, it would be Trinan's father. Thankfully, Bridget didn't take slaying that seriously. Problem was, she didn't take anything seriously. Not even Gramble's marriage proposal. He'd mostly been joking, mostly. He eyed her tight-fitting armor and curves, before he remembered himself and flicked his eyes up to her face. Only then did he realize she was furious. Ah, hey there, hooligans. What's going on? Trinan. The two didn't acknowledge his presence, throwing open the door and stomping into the barracks without a glance in his direction. Gramble set his jaw. They might be angry, but that was no excuse to be rude. He followed after them, irritated, and found his own team members waiting for him inside the door. How did it go? Petri asked, anxiety written all over his face. Did the Magister listen to you? Are we going to be able to kill this fucker? Christoph growled. Gramble blinked, then scowled. No, he said shortly. I was able to speak to him, but the Magister has either gone mad, or it's exactly as we were told. He didn't listen to a word I had to say and damn near ripped my head off when I tried to tell him about the Necromancer. His fellow members of Team Weaver were just as pleased as he was at this turn of events. Christoph seemed mightily peeved while Petri despaired. Gramble rubbed at his right temple and exhaled explosively. I need a drink he muttered to himself. He walked forward and turned toward his room, hoping to sink into the bottle he had sitting on his shelf. Locally brewed, the stuff tasted like pickled toes, but hit like a hammerman on festival day. Perfect for a low-ranked slayer. His hand was extended, reaching for his door handle, when he noticed something out of the corner of his eye. Bridget and Trinan, still looking like they'd been chewing on gallstones, had rounded up Chol and Arthur, the other two members of their team, and were now engaged in a furious, whispered conversation. Bridget in particular seemed extremely animated, shoving fingers in people's faces, and generally appeared ready to bite someone's nose off. What in the Empire are they doing? Gramble wondered aloud. In fact, where had they come from? He'd walked to the barracks from the city, and those two had come from the opposite direction, which meant they'd come from the gate. He frowned, suspicious. Did they know something he didn't? Something to do with the rifts. Ever since he'd arrived, there had been the expected jockeying for position between the Slayer teams, friendly competition for resources, cause, experience, the usual stuff. If those bastards were keeping secrets now, when their lives were on the line Gramble wasn't having it. Anger bubbling up in his chest, he walked over to the table the hooligans were sat around, pulled over a chair for himself, and sat down heavily. Trinan shot him an irritated glance. Do you mind? He growled. We're having a team meeting. Under normal circumstances. I wouldn't dare intrude Gramble said, placing a hand on his chest. But these are far from normal circumstances. It's in our best interest to share information, wouldn't you agree? Stony silence met him and he smiled into the void. For example, I just returned from my meeting with Magister Piranus. I don't mind telling you it was a disaster. If the man hasn't been affected by mind magic, then he's surely gone insane. Trinan grunted. I told you that was the case two days ago. You told me I'd be wasting my time, but you didn't tell me why. That earned him a glare from the normally stoic team leader. Gramble, I want you off this fucking table, now. Tell me where you and Bridget went. Trinan stood, a murderous gleam in his eye. I'm not in the mood for your bullshit, Gramble. This isn't the time to be playing stupid fucking games. I'm the one playing games. He retorted hotly. I'm not the one keeping secrets during a crisis. Where did you go? I'm sure Team Starfire would like to know what's been going on up the mountain. In fact, why don't I get them? Won't take a second. He leapt from his chair and began knocking on doors down the corridor as Trinan continued to glare at his back, slowly grinding his teeth. It didn't take long for faces to start poking out of rooms, including that of Samantha, the third team leader in Cragwhistle. When she saw who was causing the disturbance, she wasn't pleased. Gramble she said in a flat tone of voice, Why in the name of the divines are you bashing on my door? This had better be good. 
The mage smiled confidently and gestured toward the common room where Trinan and the others sat. Why don't you ask the hooligans? They're the ones who have been calling meetings. Unimpressed, Samantha glared at the pudgy magic flinger, arms folded across her chest. What is he on about, Trinan? Beats me. They know something Gramble said through a forced smile, and they aren't sharing. Trinan and Bridget went up the mountain. Despite being no fan of the man in front of her, this was enough to pique Samantha's interest. She leaned forward. Is that right? She said, emerging from her room at last. Did you learn anything about that freaky light we saw? If you're curious, you can always go up and ask the necromancer yourself training ground out. Doors that way, Sam, Gramble. If you've already gone and spoken to him, it would be redundant for me to do the same Gramble said. And, I'm sure you would never keep important information from your fellow slayers. Through all of this, Bridget sat in stony silence, visibly fuming. Her hands clenched into fists on the tabletop. Something had seriously upset her, which was unusual. Gramble felt more confident than ever there was something here. Something important. Throw us a bone, Trin and Samantha said, at last. I don't want to go up there and risk my team's lives on a fact-finding expedition. But if you did go up and speak to that man, you must have learned something. Trinan grunted. Do you really believe I'd hold back critical information? If I had something useful, I'd tell you, even that prick he said, gesturing toward Gramble who grinned and sat back in his chair. Any little thing could be critical at the moment Samantha reasoned even the tiniest detail. I've been having nightmares of being turned undead these past nights, and I know I'm not the only one. If something doesn't change soon, I'm worried one of us is going to snap and do something they'll regret. Trinan and Bridget shared a quick glance. Fine, he sighed. I can say a little. By this time, the common room was almost full as every slayer still in the barracks had squeezed in, wanting to know just what was going on. Bridget and I went up the mountain to see what had happened after that light we'd seen went out. If the necromancer was dead, we needed to know so we could prepare to fight off the kin. Praiseworthy dedication to your duty. Fuck you, Gramble. Really? I was simply Dash. Shut the fuck up, Gramble Samantha cut him off. Go on, Trinan sighed. We went up there and spoke to the man. Had a nice chat. You spoke to him. Samantha asked, brow raised. Yes. Didn't have much choice once the skeletons had spotted us. Did we? To summarize, he'd cast some sort of big fucking ritual. He wasn't dead. But weakened, the rift was fine. His skeletons were fine. End of story. He was weakened. Gramble shouted. How weak? We could sortie up the mountain and attack him right now. The hooligan team leader stared at him evenly. You go for it. I wish you and team weave the best of luck. My team will sit tight right here. Coward Gramble spat, only to slide back in his chair as Trinan leapt to his feet, glowering. Say that again, you fucking hog. Say it again. Trinan, cool it Samantha snapped, standing and putting a hand on his chest. We don't want to fight amongst ourselves. Not now. For a tense few moments, nobody spoke, until Trinan finally sat. Still breathing heavily, his face tight with anger. If you want to die, go up the mountain and fight he said with finality. I won't push my team members to their own deaths. Weekend or not, that man is more than we can handle. He sighed. At least he seems amenable. Villagers have been going up to see him every day, apparently. I don't fucking know why, but the guards at the gate told me, and I believe them. He doesn't kill them, doesn't even talk to them. For whatever reason, he spoke to us, and I think he would again if we went up. The Hammerman shrugged. If you want to learn more about him, go and speak to him. I don't think you'll get yourself killed, but I could be wrong, and it's all some elaborate game he's playing. Silence fell once more as each slayer considered what he'd said. None were particularly eager to speak to a necromancer. They weren't afraid of death, certainly feared it less than most people, but dying was the least of their concerns on this mountain. You aren't going to tell them, Bridget said finally, a bubbling heat in her voice. Trinan set his jaw. No, I'm not going to tell them. Gramble leapt on this opportunity. You were keeping something from us after all. He crowed. Never would have expected it from honest Trinan. What is it? What did you learn? Bridget flicked a glance at her team leader, whose mouth remained resolutely shut. She sucked in a breath and looked up at the rest of them. He told us his name. Tyron Steelham. This pronouncement was met with dead silence. Then a babble of mixed voices broke out at once. 
bullshit Samantha breathed. Worthless nonsense Gramble slumped. He'd hoped for something better than the lies of a madman. Slayers discussed animatedly around the room, one talking over the other as they expressed a mix of disbelief, shock, derision and fear. He said he killed Magnin and Beery. Bridget shouted, pounding a fist on the table. He confessed right in front of us. Bridget. Trinan roared, and she flinched. He did no such thing he clarified to the suddenly quiet audience. He said, and I fucking quote, my parents died because of me. Isn't that right? The swordswoman set her jaw, but nodded. Make of that what you will. I don't fucking care. If you think he's legitimate, or insane, or just joking, I don't fucking care. Go and talk to him yourselves. I'm getting a damn drink. So saying, he turned and stormed toward the exit, only stopping to plant a foot in Gramble's chest, causing the mage to yelp, as his chair tipped backwards, and he thudded hard into the floor. Bridget sat with her hands still clenched on the table in front of her. You alright, Bridge? Chol asked quietly, putting a hand on her friend's shoulder. No, the swordswoman scowled. I'm not alright, but I will be. Don't do anything stupid, Bridge Arthur advised her as Gramble was helped up from the ground by his teammates cursing. She laughed bitterly. I know I don't stand a chance against that prick. I'm not that eager to die. I was mainly talking about getting pissed. I'm going to find whatever hole Trinan is crawling into and join him. You want to come? Arthur and Chol shared a glance. The former shrugged, the latter smiled. Why not? We'll make it a team session. Chapter 166 Huddled in his cave, Tyron continued to scribble away in his book of notes, face a mask of concentration. There were so many things for him to work on, it was difficult for him to focus on a single thing at a time. He'd promised Dove he would work on a new status ritual, and he would, but when was he going to find the time? The depths of his new space, the Oswari, beckoned him constantly and required study. But he was reluctant to explore it too soon, until he better understood what it was he had created. He wanted to tread lightly, lest he make a terrible mistake. Another thought had bubbled up in his head, the idea that his minions could remain behind on the mountain after he left, and continue to fight against the kin. As far as he knew, such a thing was impossible. No matter how skillfully, how perfectly he formed the conduit between himself and his minions, it would never stretch far enough to move his magic from one side of the province to the other. Even if it did, gaps and holes would appear along the way, meaning not a single drop of energy, no matter how much he fed into it, would reach the other side. Was there a solution? Maybe. A construct formed of bone to soak up the ambient magic spewing out of the rift and feed it into his minions, would theoretically be able to feed them the power they needed. But he had a feeling it wouldn't be that easy. For starters, the minions would still be connected to him via a conduit, which would attempt to pull magic from him the second this new source wasn't sufficient. If enough minions tried to draw from him at once, and if his body could actually attempt to supply it from such a range, it was possible he would die. All the magic would be ripped out of him in a second, and he'd hit the floor before he'd even realize what had happened. Possibly. Then there was the issue of control. The skeletons were semi-autonomous, able to make simple, routine decisions for themselves. Minor things that helped them complete the tasks he gave them. But anything more complex was completely out of their reach. Since instructions were transmitted through the conduit, there was no way he could communicate with the skeletons over such a distance. Despite all the issues, none of which he had a solution for, he still felt there was something there, a possibility that might enable him to continue reaping experience via combating the rift while living in Kenmore. On the page in front of him, a rudimentary design for a large, bull-sized construct formed of human bones was taking shape. Scribbled notes, some crossed out, some circled, spirals of runes in various configurations, and dot points, elaborating on the questions overhanging the design surrounded the image. There was a rustling at the cave entrance, and Tyron scowled at his broken concentration. Are they back again? Hey, don't get pissed at me. You're the one who asked me to tell you. I know Tyron sighed. I appreciate it. How's it been going with your king killing? As he spoke, he pushed himself to his feet and stepped out of the cave to find Dove waiting for him by the exit. Is it having the effect I would have liked to see? No. The skeleton shrugged his bony shoulders. But I must say, it's been nice to be killing the kin again. Cathartic. Tyron raised his brows. Anything that was good for the former summoner's state of mind was ultimately a good thing. Fought along, 
He'd feared Dove was dangling over a cliff's edge, or had already jumped off. That's good. I haven't forgotten about what I promised you either. I'll have your armor ready in the next few days, and I'm still thinking on the ritual. Don't worry. Dove made a disgusted noise. Imagine being able to fight the kin while sitting on your backside inside a cave studying magic. Holy fucking shit. That is the dream. The necromancer winked at him. Still confident summoner is the better class. Yes. His mentor tried to sound firm in his answer, but Tyron could sense him wavering. He chuckled as he began to make his way down the mountain. Usual place. The usual place. If you want to, feel free to take a look at my notes. I'm trying to design a bone constructing could use your feedback. The onyx skeleton froze in place. Is that? No, it's not a dick. You really know how to kick a man when he's down Dove groaned, his shoulders slumping. Tyron turned his back in disgust and continued walking, muttering under his breath as he went. Of all the things he could be devoting time to, creating an artificial manhood for a dead person, seemed by far the most ludicrous. The further down the slope he got, the more his ire began to shift to the people he knew were waiting for him. Why in the name of the dark gods did they keep coming? He was no savior to them, no matter what the three said. Yet, no matter how he tried to communicate that, delegations from the village continued to climb the mountain. In fact, they were getting worse. Now they were bringing tribute, and they wouldn't leave until he accepted it. It was a mistake to take it the first time he muttered to himself. It only encouraged them. He thought they were just being polite, and uncomfortable about it as he was. He thought it would be rude not to take it. Now he had to trudge several hundred meters down the mountain every day to collect what they offered him. It's not like he needed it. These people were dirt poor. Refugees who'd left everything they had behind. What little they still possessed, should be going into helping them build their new lives. He tried to say as much, but they wouldn't listen. Skeleton bodyguards in place around him, Tyron came into the relatively flat ground of the clearing, to find nearly a dozen people in attendance. He sighed. Ragged clothing, faces lined with years of struggle. Grim expressions, these were worshippers of the three all right. Like they were carved out of old tree roots. These people were tough, he gave them that much. At the head of the group, an old woman stood, leaning heavily on the cane she held in her right hand. Would she sit down if I asked her to? Tyron wondered to himself, then grimaced. Not a chance. I told the last group, and I'll tell you the same. I don't require tribute or donations, he said shortly as he approached the group, stopping five meters away. What possessions and currency you possess is far better spent on yourselves than it is on me. Wordlessly, the old woman at the front nodded, then bowed and held out a sack in front, her arms trembling with the weight of it. He knew she'd hold it until she collapsed if he didn't take it. These people were stubborn, so he instructed a skeleton to collect it. The minion took the roughly sewn leather sack and brought it back, opening it close to Tyron, so he could inspect what was inside. If it was money, he'd have to find a way to slip it to Orton again. Instead, his eyes widened slightly, and the old woman smiled to see it. Inside the sack, he found a jumble of assorted bones, possibly enough for a full skeleton. Did these come from one set of remains? He asked. Yes. With a voice as rough as bark and eyes as cold as winter, the old woman answered him for the group. Tyron made a snap decision. If you insist on giving me things, though again I ask you not to, I am no servant he trailed off. I am technically no servant of your gods, and I do not believe I am anyone's salvation. However, if you insist on ignoring me, then this is the only thing I will accept from now on. He took the bag from the skeleton and held it up. Bones, he said. Human bones. Or horse. Full skeletons are much preferred. He tried to keep the hunger from his voice, though it was difficult. The supply of remains he'd brought with him had dwindled almost to nothing. Repairing the skeletons as they fought, various experiments, materials for molding armor, all took a little bone here and there. Be careful. Any place with too many bodies and thick death magic will result in wild undead, which can be extremely dangerous. If you intend to do this for me, then I prefer you didn't come to harm. He paused, then narrowed his eyes. And please don't kill anyone for their bones. Hopefully, he didn't have to specify that. The old woman narrowed her eyes and looked a little offended, so they probably wouldn't. Finally, he said, if you find a good source of remains, but need help securing them, let me know. I will send skeletons, or assist myself. 
The old woman bowed, turned and began to leave, the others trailing in her wake. When he thought the audience was over, Tyron considered what had transpired for a moment, before he shrugged and made to leave, only to find one young woman had remained behind. He regarded her as she took several steps forward, arms folded across her chest. This was a slayer. At a mental command, the skeletons around him drew closer, and he cursed himself for not wearing his armor. Too incautious. Just because the villagers haven't wanted to harm me, doesn't mean someone else won't try. He strove to keep his anger from his face as the slayer approached. Dark head, with a long sleeved coat and her hair bound back, she looked mature for a bronze ranked slayer, certainly for one fresh out of the academy. That's close enough he said, ensuring there were two ranks of shielded minions between them. Just to be safe, he began to form the mind domination spell his hands flickering out the sigils discreetly, hidden from view. If you have something to say, please speak your mind. Calculating brown eyes watched him, with no sign of fear in them, though he may have detected the slightest trembling in her fingers. My name is Samantha Ingthorn, she said, leader of Team Starlight. Ah, Tyron nodded. The all-female team, I've heard of you. Is there an issue with an all-female team? She asked, her voice hardening a fraction. No, it's simply unusual. Tyron's response was flat and direct, and the Slayer seemed to be satisfied. I apologize if I seem defensive. Some people don't approve. It's no matter. Though I assume you didn't come here, at the potential risk of your soul, to discuss prejudice. I have many things that occupy my time, and would be grateful if you would come to the point. Samantha nodded, seeming to have expected as much. She continued to watch him, assessing. I wanted to meet you, she said finally. Trinan and Bridget spoke to you and returned alive, along with so many townsfolk. It seemed to me that if I was going to place my trust, and the lives of my team, in your hands, I should at the very least meet you. People are still worried I'm going to murder everyone in town. Tyron asked, a hint of amusement creeping through. You told those villagers yourself that you needed bones. I do, he said desperately. There's an obvious and easy way for you to get them, she shrugged. If you think committing mass murder is obvious and easy, then perhaps you are more dangerous than I am, Tyron chuckled. To date, there are very few among my minions that I have killed myself. So, there are some, of course, slayers included. Is there a reason I shouldn't fear becoming one of them? What makes us so different than those you've already killed? The question was asked in a casual manner, though he could see how intent she was on getting an answer. She was a leader, wanting to ascertain just how safe her people were. He respected that. They tried to kill me, instead they were killed, and now they serve in death, he said simply. If you choose to attack me, then that will also be your fate. Samantha absorbed that, then Tyron shrugged. Of course, you have no way to determine if what I have said is the truth. I'm fully aware I have put you and your team in a no-win situation, but that is the fate of the weak in this realm, I'm afraid. Even your parents. A surge of anger erupted in his chest at the question, his eyes turned blisteringly cold. Especially my parents, he replied. The difference is that Magnan and Beery did everything they could to scratch and claw their way to power. They burned themselves trying to break free. They failed at the final hurdle. I will not. Those dark eyes continued to regard him. Can you tell me how they died? She asked. Tyron glared. Why? She wilted a fraction under the weight of that stare. But she didn't retreat. I wanted to hear it. If the Magisters lied to us, then I want to know the truth. For a full minute Tyron considered in silence, until at last he answered, Very well. Let me tell you of two slayers who defied the gods. Chapter 167 The ceiling of the Grand Cathedral was a remarkable piece of magic engineering, and Lady Resilia Erin couldn't help but feel a stir in her heart every time she saw it. Held up by massive pillars, each weighing thousands of tons, the peak of the arches reached over a hundred meters from the ground. That vast empty space was filled with enchanted illusions of clouds, streaks of sunlight, angels, and, perhaps, a glimpse of the gods themselves. There was a shimmer to enchanted marble that no other substance could quite replicate. It seemed to glow in the sunlight, reflecting a radiant glory that seemed holy to all who beheld it. Perhaps that was why the material was restricted to the temples. Seated in her alcove beneath a breathtaking painting of the first martyr, Dimitri, who had given his life in the service of the newborn gods in the first crusade, she heard the priest approaching well before he reached her. No matter how they muffled the floor with thick rugs, 
or covered the walls with elaborate tapestries. Even the softest footsteps seemed to echo within the hall. When Father Chern stepped into the alcove, he found the Lady Erin already staring at him, her piercing ice blue eyes seeming to look straight through him. A formidable woman, she hadn't made it to her current position through luck. It was always worth watching those who rose so quickly. They would either be snuffed out after a blaze of glory, or sustain their rise all the way to the top. The trick was trying to work out which was which. The bishop is ready to receive you now, Lady Erin. My thanks Lord Chern. He smiled thinly. Please refer to me as Father Chern. All claims I had to my noble house were relinquished when I donned the cloth. That is the tradition, yes. Unhurried, the diminutive noble brushed down her immaculate skirt before she rose, posture perfect, eyes steady. Father Chern mastered himself enough to keep the sneer from his face. There was no arena in which the noble houses wouldn't squabble with each other even within the church. As she had subtly pointed out, it was tradition for those of high birth who joined the church to sever ties with their families. But in practice, they seldom did. From the main hall, down a broad, spacious hallway, the pair arrived outside a large, polished oak door. The priest knocked once and opened the door without waiting for a response, then stepped aside to allow Lady Erin to step through. She walked past him without a glance, and entered an office that put her own within the Magister's Tower to shame. Opulence dripped from every wall, every inch of floor. Statues, carvings, paintings, even the ceremonial robes displayed in the center of the room, gleamed with enchanted gems, cores and gold thread. The bishop stood as she entered, a reserved smile on his face. Hands clasped behind his back, he walked out from behind his desk and approached the entrance. Thank you, Father Chern. That will be all. As you will, bishop. The priest closed the heavy door behind him, leaving the two alone in the room. If the bishop's expression softened in front of his daughter, she couldn't detect it. She imagined briefly what more common families would do at times like this. Embrace. Exchange pleasantries. She couldn't imagine it. There wasn't time for such things. Not when the game was on and the stakes were so high. And the game was always on. Daughter the bishop Erin greeted her, rings gleaming on his fingers as he folded his hands atop each other. What news do you bring? Perhaps a drink and a seat, father. If I must make my way through the city to the cathedral to satisfy your curiosity, you should offer refreshment at the very least. He grunted, half amused, half irritated before he invited her to sit and made his way to the decanter at the side of the room, filled with ruby red wine. How do you keep all the names straight, she asked as he poured glasses for the two of them, considering more than two-thirds of the clergy come from the same five families. He was Bishop Aaron, but was hardly the only member of the family serving within this one cathedral, let alone in the church as a whole across the province. There may have been dozens of father chants, probably were, considering how useless they were. Promotion was unlikely for the rabble of that house. Here, drink the bishop said, a touch ungraciously, offering the glass to his daughter. She accepted it with magnanimity. You are acting a touch impatient recently, Lady Erin observed. Perhaps there is movement amongst the clergy. When is there not? Her father grunted as he sat opposite her. The chairs were luxurious, and as she always did, the lady surreptitiously slid a hand along the fur. She would have to get some, if not for her office then her residence. Which kin did it come from? The archbishops have been jumpy lately. Or, perhaps more accurately, they are still jumpy. The break at Woodsedge seemed to set them off, which is to be expected. But they haven't calmed down since. The lady took a sip of her wine. Delicious. Her father refused to drink anything that hadn't been aged at least five decades. The depth of flavor, the perfect sour notes. She swirled her glass. Truly an excellent wine. Do we still have no leads as to the source of their unease? She asked, and her father scowled. He was off balance, normally he wouldn't show this much emotion. Tensions within the clergy must be running high. Am I reporting to you, or you to me? He asked evenly. She raised a brow. This is a mutual and fair exchange of information, father. We must support those with the closest blood ties within the family, after all. Left unsaid was the difference in their positions. She was second in line to be head of the house, behind her cousin, whereas her uncle, the current head, had shipped his brother to the church upon his ascension. Lady Erin was in a position of strength within the house, her father was not. I have given you information. What do you have for me? 
She pursed her lips as she eyed him steadily. He'd given her nothing they hadn't discussed a hundred times before. Nevertheless, she yielded. There is something amiss with the magisters, she said, trying to keep her distaste from her voice. Her role was an important one, granted by the Baron himself, yet she couldn't bring herself to like it. Where she had expected polished professionalism and clear-eyed stewards of the province's slayers, she had instead found bickering children comfortable and lazy. What is it this time? The reports. Every keep, every rift, every kin, all activity regarding them is documented and collected in the tower for examination. I review as much of it as I possibly can personally, to ensure the mages are doing their jobs. And, have reports been going missing? She shook her head. The opposite. Her father blinked. The reports are arriving more frequently. Precisely. I'm not sure if I share your concern over this promptly filed paperwork. It's significant, she insisted. A change in behavior, a shift in the normal patterns, always signifies something underlying. The magisters have been lax for decades. Slayers hate filing their documents, and the mages are getting less and less inclined to make them. If the reports are coming in more regularly, then she trailed off allowing her father to fill in the blanks. Either the magisters have developed a work ethic his tone left no doubt how unlikely he thought that might be. Or the slayers have discovered a taste for documentation. Equally unlikely. That is interesting he father noted. Any idea as to what may be the cause? Not yet. But I am investigating. How have the magisters responded? They don't seem to have noticed the difference. Have they really become so lax at their duties? Her father showed a hint, a bare whisper of true dismay as he said this and Lady Erin resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Some nobles, her father among them, apparently, seemed very reluctant to acknowledge that others may be as mired in intrigue and idleness as they themselves. Those blessed with the divine right were different, determined, touched by the gods themselves, but others. Her lip cold despite her best efforts. Unable to see the wood for the trees, they seemed to believe that their own corruption and incompetence, was somehow an isolated occurrence as opposed to a more universal malice. The gods saw all, and a reckoning was past due. It isn't that they are lazy, as such she answered the bishop's question, but rather they focus on some parts of their duties above others. Rigorous record keeping has fallen by the wayside, it's true, but they are zealous, when it comes to meeting out punishment upon the slayers. As well they should her father mused, another slayer uprising is the last thing we need as if brutalizing them would lead to anything else. Quite so she demurred. Now, I have shared something of value. It is time for you to do the same. Again, that hint of a frown, the tightening around the eyes. The old man was slipping. I am somewhat reluctant to share this he said slowly, because it is difficult to verify. Rumor, or hearsay, neither. Rather rumblings. An interesting choice of phrase. The bishop leaned forward and clasped his hands together, watching her over his intertwined fingers. You know of the oracles. Lady Erin nodded, eyes calculating. Everyone knows of the oracles. That's true, but most of what they know is nonsense. Most of us never so much as see them. I've never seen them. Anything that touched on them was a closely guarded secret. Only the archbishops were able to come into contact with them. There are rumors that space is being made within their compound. Furniture is being brought in. Carpenters and the like have been hired. I've seen the accounting books myself. The noble lady's mind raced. Why would they be making space? Increasing the number of residents within the compound. Why would they need to increase the number of residents? As far as she was aware, the number of oracles kept in the province was more or less constant. They were only replaced when they died. In which case, there would be no need to make more room. They're bringing in oracles from outside, she murmured. The bishop nodded gravely. So I suspect. If they were doing that then where would they come from? It wouldn't make sense for them to come from the north or south, which meant. They're coming from the central province, from the capital. It's difficult to say. I can't prove any of this her father cautioned, but Resilia's mind was already leaps ahead. If they were bringing in oracles from the central province, that meant there was an issue, a serious issue. The archbishops were unsettled, acting erratically. Was there an issue with the oracles themselves? Something they couldn't see. In which case, the call had been made to summon the high oracles from the central province, perhaps to divine what had been hidden. The oracles communed directly with the gods themselves. What could possibly escape their sight? Suddenly uneasy, Lady Erin rose from her seat. 
Thank you, father. I believe this will prove to be useful information. He rose along with her. Thank you for the visit, daughter. If you learn anything more, be sure to let me know. Any advantage we can gain within the clergy is worth it. If she was right, then maneuvering for the next archbishop's seat was the least of his concerns. After making her goodbyes, she left her father's office, then made her way out of the temple, mind a buzz. Repeatedly, she had to caution herself not to jump to conclusions. If she made the wrong decisions at this early stage, it could prove devastating. When the oracles moved, it was a sign the divines themselves were moving, and they were coming here to the western province. Something momentous was on the horizon. Distant still, but it was coming. She had to find out what. Chapter 168. Tyron stepped through the rift back onto the mountain, still shivering as he shook the rime from his cloak. No matter how many layers he put on, the realm these kin belonged to was beyond freezing. Around him, his skeletons emerged, as well as Dove, who jauntily swaggered onto the trail. What's the problem? Flesh getting you down? He asked mockingly. Yes, yes. You don't feel the cold. Very funny. Despite being halfway up a mountain, surrounded by frost-covered trees and plants, with a chilling wind trying to creep inside his cloak, he relaxed. Compared to the never-ending storm of ice and snow on the other side, the climate around Cragwistle was luxurious. If he didn't have the skeletons to wade through the snow drifts and make a path for him, getting anywhere over there would be a gigantic pain in the backside. Well, at least it was a successful trip. You got what you needed, didn't you? Tyron clutched at the bag tied to his belt, feeling the large cores scrape against each other within. Hopefully, yes. If it isn't enough, we'll just have to go back again in a few days. Maybe by then the blood flow will have returned to your extremities, the skeleton said, chattering his onyx jaw in a somehow suggestive manner. Ignoring the genital-related idiocy, the necromancer began to trudge his way down the slope, arranging his undead in a wide protective ring around him. They moved so lightly, the skeletons, due to their low weight. With all the improvements he'd made, they were well balanced, and seemed able to traverse the rocky terrain with ease. He himself was not nearly so graceful. With everything we gathered, I should have enough cause to make some armor for you as well. There's only so much I can do with chips, no matter how well I can arrange them. To give you a more significant pool of magic to work with, something larger is required. Dove seemed pleased with the news. There's not much I can do with it at this point, but I'll never say no to a bit more magic. A shame those damn mammoths don't have fourth grade calls. From the size of them, you'd think they would. If they were strong enough to hold cores of that quality, we'd be getting flattened by them tire and remarked dryly. I didn't get a good look, but I think we collected at least one third grade, which I'll use for your armor. If I combine the rest, that should be enough to power my construct. So far, they hadn't encountered any monsters stronger than the mammoths, even on the other side of the rift. That wasn't to say they didn't exist, but perhaps the rift was still too small to attract more dangerous creatures, unable to fit themselves through. Or perhaps the frozen wasteland was a recently fallen realm, without enough time to be fully corrupted by wild magic. Either way, he was grateful. Even with his army of skeletons, he wouldn't be willing to fight on the other side of nearly any other rift in the province, certainly not alone. When they arrived down the mountain, Tyron found a crowd of villagers waiting beneath his cave inside. At least in the rift, he hadn't needed to cater to these visitors. Then he spied a familiar-looking old woman at the fore of the group. It had been a week since he'd tasked a group with finding him more skeletons, and she was certainly the person he'd spoken to at that time. If they had bones, this was a different matter entirely. With a spring in his step, Tyron made his way down the trail, eyes alight with anticipation. Welcome back, he greeted them. I'm hoping you have something for me. He tried to keep the eagerness from his voice, but struggled. A woman of few words, the apparent leader of the group nodded and indicated for some of the others to step forward, which they did. Bulging sacks on their shoulders, six young men approached, straining against the apparent weight before they gently eased their burdens onto the ground. At his direction, the undead stepped forward and inspected each, reaching inside and withdrawing what were clearly bones that had been dug up recently. There's thirty full skeletons there the old woman finally spoke, her voice thin, but with a hint of iron in it. At least as near as we can tell. Where did you get them? Tyron asked. Mass graves, she replied, simply. Some places had too many dead, so they dropped them all in a hole. They were barely covered in dirt. 
These came from near Underhill, if you've heard of it. He hadn't. There were hundreds, if not thousands of villages and farming communities, who'd been overrun by the kin following the break. Tyron could name maybe five of those. If so many dead were piled in a heap, some of them should have risen on their own. Did you see any wild undead there? We didn't came the reply, though we were sure to check. That was odd. He doubted the people who buried the bodies, had been sensitive enough to find areas with low ambient magic, or devoid of death magic. In fact, given so many had been buried so carelessly, there should be roving packs of zombies and skeletons popping up all over the place. Something didn't make sense. You've done extremely well, he said. Wait a moment. He ducked into the cave and rummaged for a bit before emerging with a small pouch of coin. Here's some payment for your efforts. I know you went to great lengths to get these for me. There's a gold worth of silver in there. He tossed the pouch to the old lady, who snatched it out of the air with a hand like a staff python. At the mention of how much he was paying them, wide-eyed looks and muttering broke out amongst the small crowd. If you make another trip, I'll pay the same again. As many times as you're willing to do it. Although I might have to start paying you in cause he finished realizing he hadn't brought that much coin with him. No matter, he had agents in Foxbridge who purchased cores for his shop. He could fill the villagers' pockets with chips and low-grade cores. Then they could sell them to his supplier, who would then on sell back to him. His skeletons brought the bags full of remains toward him, and he gleefully reached inside, examining what they brought him. Immediately, he began to tut. If you are going to make another trip, come and see me before you leave, he said to the group who were beginning to leave. I'll show you how to treat these a little better. Most of the remains were in poor condition, and there were several children's skeletons mixed in, which he separated and buried as best he could. When all was said and done, there were 22 sets of remains he could work with, with miscellaneous bones left to the side. You look way too happy for a man playing with human remains, Dove observed from the side. This class is not healthy for your social life. Anyone who sees you grinning like a fool over a dead person's ribs is not going to be your friend. Such useless chatter wasn't worth dignifying with a response. Instead, Tyron held up one of said ribs. These are exactly what I need for crafting my bone construct. Of course, I'm excited. He'd hoped that the villagers might come through with some bones. But he really hadn't expected it to actually happen. Now that he had materials to work with, there were so many things he could test and try, he was almost dizzy with the possibilities. Runes and spell forms swam through his head as he instructed his undead to gather all the bones and separate them into piles. Of course, the first thing he wanted to do was summon the door to the ossuary and see what would happen if he installed some of these skeletons into the sconces along the walls. But he hesitated to do so. He simply didn't know enough about that space and would rather investigate it a little more on his own before using it with his undead. Despite knowing it was sure to be useful, he kept putting off exploring it in more detail. For some reason, it unnerved him, and he had several suspicions that not all was as it seemed within that space. Perhaps a few more levels in his new class would help elaborate on what was possible within the ossuary, and surely this latest trip would be enough to tip him over to level 44. If not, he would just have to keep grinding. In the meantime, he had something else he wanted to work on. Despite having just returned from a difficult expedition beyond the rift, Tyron barely took the time to eat, drink and change his clothes, before he threw himself back into his work. He'd carefully designed the arrays he would need. Now it was simply time to take out his tools and put them to work, as well as create a vessel in which to hold them. Despite his confidence, he took his time working with his tools. Hunched over the table inside the cave, a makeshift glass held in front of his face by a skeleton. These weren't ideal working conditions, but they were good enough. After two hours, the first of the mammoth cores was ready, and he smiled to himself as he carefully examined it. The theory was simple, the issue was doing it as efficiently as possible. He already knew how to use a core to absorb ambient magic. That was simple, the basics of the basics. He also knew how to convert that non-attributed energy into death magic. This was a lot more complicated, but nothing too difficult. He also knew how to take that energy and feed it into the communal pool that linked his minion squads. In effect, he wasn't producing anything new. His feeder skeletons already did this. The difference was the scale. Just because something worked on a small or even medium scale, didn't mean it would function the same when the volume of energy was much larger. 
In fact, it wouldn't. If his calculations were correct, this construct would be pulling in almost 20 times the amount of energy a single feeder skeleton drew in. If it proved successful, then he could use the design as the basis for creating even larger constructs. The single largest limiting factor of the Necromancer class remained the magic requirements. He intended to leverage all of his enchanting expertise to overcome that burden. If he soon learned how to create ever more powerful undead, then his need for more magic would only grow more acute. When the four mammoth calls were done, he turned his attention to creating a housing for them. He did this by taking two complete rib cages, fusing them together and molding them until they were roughly spherical with a flattened base. Taking the skulls from both of the skeletons he'd already leveraged, he fused these together back to back, then mounted them atop the sphere. Flipping it over, he opened a hole in the bottom and got to work mounting his calls, then inscribing sigils and runes around them, binding them together. When this was done, he reached into his growing supply of chips, and began to form them into arrays, which he mounted around the major calls, taking care to perfectly form and space every part of his work. When he was finally satisfied, he was surprised to realize he'd been hunched over his table for over a day. Blinking the dryness from his eyes, he sat back with an exhausted sigh, letting his tools fall to the table. Finally done, huh? Dove asked from the cave entrance. Tyron turned to regard the onyx skeleton before he nodded. I think so. Hopefully it works as intended. The more magic I can provide to my minions through external means, the more undead I can support. Of course, there was more to it than just that. More magic available to his skeletons also made them stronger. They could move faster and hit harder with more energy being supplied to them. With some difficulty, the necromancer gathered up his ghoulish creation and took it outside, where he performed the final tuning. To feed energy into the pool his minions made use of, he bound it to four different feeder skeletons, by placing a new enchantment array within each that would form the conduit from their end. If it all worked as intended, these skeletons would be pulling vastly more energy than they did before, then supplying it to the 20 undead they were linked with. Let's see how it goes he said, rubbing his hands together. With a touch, he activated the runes, and watched carefully as his construct came to life. Almost immediately, it began to draw on the ambient magic, the cores dragging it in. With his spell-enhanced eyes, he could see the flow of power, and was delighted to see death magic being produced in the heart of the construct, energy that then began to feed out to the skeletons through newly formed conduits. Tyron clapped his hands together. Now he had to test it in combat. He scurried back into the cave to fetch his notes and a pen. Exhaustive trials would be necessary to see how effective his latest innovation could be. Chapter 169 I have to admit, the look is growing on me. It's not really meant for aesthetics. It's for protection and to increase your magic supply. Dove struck a pose, flaring his skeletal arms wide as his hollow sockets gazed meaningfully into the distance. No matter how hard you try to eliminate the drama, when you're working with bones and black magic, things are just going to look badass, no matter what. Unlike Tyron's armor, which was largely formed of smooth, condensed bone plating, Dove had insisted on a few modifications to his own. Spikes here and there, a cape for some reason, pauldrons far wider than they needed to be. All these changes did was reduce the utility of the armor. But the former Slayer didn't care. In order to add all of the absurd components, Tyron had been forced to hollow out almost all of the armor, thinning the bone to the point it was hardly more resistant to damage than normal bones. He had to keep the weight down, though. Heavy armor would only drain his limited magic all the faster, since he needed it to move. In truth, the only part of Dove's body that actually needed to be protected was his skull. Within there lay the engravings that bound his soul to this realm and only if they were destroyed would he be freed from his onyx body. Are you fluttering that cape yourself? It adds to the effect. The cape in question was made from a spare blanket, so it perhaps lacked the dignity a normal, ceremonial cape of office may hold. Tyron sighed. Ultimately, he didn't care how ridiculous the skeleton appeared, so long as he was happy with the work. So you're satisfied with it. No more complaints. No more modifications. I am extremely pleased. You've outdone yourself. Another dynamic pose. I feel so powerful. Hey uh. With a loud exclamation, Dove thrust forward a bony palm and unleashed a sizzling bolt of dark magic that shot through the air and impacted a tree with a sharp crack. 
Do you mind? Tyron frowned. There's no need to pollute the mountain with stray death magic. Dove turned to him, Aya blazing in his undead eyes. Are you fucking kidding me? You've got hundreds of minions running around, and you've been casting rituals, shaping bones and doing all sorts of shady shit. I've been pissing drops of death magic, while you've been firing off like a fucking hose. But I clean up after myself Tyron insisted, and removing traces of death energy from living things. Like trees is a lot harder than scrubbing it from the ambient magic. You know that. The necromancer had gone to great lengths to try and keep the signs of his temporary inhabitants on the mountain to a minimum. On the same day he'd arrived, he'd placed a race to passively filter out the arcane energy that radiated from his undead rituals and spells. Of course, when he did something like create the ossuary, those hadn't been enough, and he had to step in himself. Dove flipped him a rude gesture. Fine, he harumphed. I do have a lot more energy than I did before. I can feel the flow. You can. That was interesting. Tyron himself contained hundreds of times more than Dove could contain. But it was always difficult to perceive just how much he held. Or how quickly it was coming in. Human senses weren't designed to work with magic. Not even when it was inside the body. Of course I can. Can't feel much else, really. Pretty much every sense has been lost. But for whatever reason, undead seem to be more sensitive to magic. I swear I can see it sometimes. Another intriguing lead. There were so many piling up in Tyron's head he was sure he was going to go mad. If he didn't get them down onto a page in time. With great effort, he pushed away this curious thought. So he could turn back to his current project. With Dove's armor out of the way. Hopefully he'd stop interrupting his work. So, any luck on that ritual? Dove asked before Tyron had taken a second step away. The necromancer ground his teeth and turned back to his friend and mentor. Obviously not. When would I have had time to do that? You do realize that if I were to actually manage to concoct a new status ritual that interfaced the unseen directly with a soul, I would almost certainly be rewarded with a mystery, right? This isn't going to happen overnight. Hey! I was just asking Dove shrugged. Of course it's going to be fucking hard. But you're the only genius I can rely on. I need that ritual, kid. Not having the touch of the unseen, my class and skills. It's eating me up, and the more magic I get, the worse I feel. For a moment, there was real, genuine pain in his voice, and Tyron couldn't help but sympathize. I know, and I haven't forgotten. Unlocking this secret will be immensely useful for me as well. But at this point, everything is theoretical. I'll need weeks, maybe months of work to break through on this. In the meantime, I have a million things I need to work on. Like your skull ball. It's not a skull ball. It's a necromantic construct. Dove stepped closer and placed a hand sympathetically on Tyron's shoulder. Kid, it's two skulls fused at the ass and glued to a ball. It looks fucking creepy and quite ridiculous. I can't help it if spheres are the most common shape for enchantment work. They have good even surface area. There's also a reason that after designs get nailed down, they change away from that shape as soon as possible. It looks dumb. Well, at least it works. That's all I care about. Sure, it's effective, but unless you want your enemies questioning your taste, you're going to have to come up with a better design. Shut up, Dove. The construct had worked very well. In fact, it had worked so well that now Tyron was running into a brand new problem. The conduits between his minions weren't sufficient to contain the amount of power he was feeding into them. A good problem to have, all things considered. But it meant he needed to go back to the drawing board and restructure the conduit network between his undead from the ground up. It was frustrating, but he had never expected he would be pushing anything like this volume of arcane energy to his undead, so bolstering the magical connections between them would have been a waste of time and resources. So you're going to try and fatten up the conduits, make them thick and powerful, Dove observed peering at the construct. Not sure I'd phrase it that way, but yes. With more magic, the skeletons are stronger faster. So if I can supply more energy, I need them to be able to handle more. It's going to take a long time, so it'll have to wait until we get back. Before he could work on the skeletons, he would need to finalize a new design. That meant drafting, testing and experimenting to find the exact ratios he wanted. Ah, time to move on to another project then. I can suggest one, if you need any ideas Dove leered suggestively. Yes, I'll need to move on. Luckily, 
I have a long list of things that are demanding my attention. Next on my list, the Oswari. The skeleton slumped. Prick, he muttered. Tyron rolled his eyes, not taking the bait. The Oswari was the key to his new class, and he fully intended to draw out all of its secrets. But he needed to be cautious. Making use of the new space without understanding it could leave him vulnerable to calamity. The first order of business was to once again summon the door. Thankfully, this wouldn't require nearly as much effort as creating the Oswari had. After all, the space had already been created. All he needed to do was manifest it. A little food, some water, and a quick splash of cold water on his face was all Tyron needed to feel rejuvenated. The more he grew, the more his constitution improved, the more absurd his physical endurance became. He may not be strong. He may not be dexterous. But he could walk up and down this mountain for days on end, without suffering much fatigue. The mental burden of working, calculating, casting magic and directing his minions, was far more draining to him than his physical exertions at this point. But thankfully he had always felt strong within his own mind. Before he could cast the ritual, he felt his minions engage in battle, and took a moment to direct them from where he stood. Repeated casts of minion sight allowed him to follow the fighting from different angles, and coordinate his undead appropriately. Thankfully, his army of skeletons still heavily outnumbered the packs of kin that flooded from the rift, and were able to leverage their numbers for relatively easy victories. Releasing a breath, he came back to himself and smiled. Killing Rifkin this easily still felt ridiculous to him. He was barely approaching a fraction of the power his parents had held. What had it felt like for them, battling against monsters all this time? Oftentimes, they'd been sent into dangerous situations, into breaks, into rifts through which new, more powerful monsters had been seen. However, a lot of the time they were sent to kill ordinary kin when the local slayers had been overwhelmed. Already, Tyron could kill hundreds of low-leveled kin with only a small exertion of effort. For Magnin and Beery, they could hold a rift like the one at Cragwasil, quite literally in their sleep. He shook off the thought. Disturbing his mind with emotional thoughts before casting a ritual was a foolish mistake he refused to make. Spending any amount of time dwelling on Magnin and Beery was like asking for the rage inside him to boil up and consume him. To work with magic, he needed to be in control. Once he was certain he had centered himself, Tyron made his way to the ritual circle, raised his hands, and began to cast. As the words of power thundered into the air, he concentrated. Dimensional magic was extremely difficult, and he was far from an expert. But all he had to do was follow the guidelines the Unseen had given him. The door to the Oswari had already been made. It existed half within his own realm and half within whatever place that room had been created. Reaching it was relatively easy. After 10 minutes, he was done. The door once again rested upon the circle as it exuded an unearthly purple light from within its arch of bones. Tyron lowered his hands and rolled his neck before he took a deep breath, then another. When he was ready, he strode forward, opened the door, and stepped inside. Or at least, he tried to. Move over, I want to take a look, Dove said, pushing in front of him. Dove what the heck, but it was too late. The former slayer had pranced through the entrance and into the ossuary, vanishing into the darkness within. Tyron followed close behind. Light he growled placing several globes around the room, and flooding it with magical radiance. The first time he'd been inside, he hadn't had the power to spend illuminating it, but now he could finally take a good look at it. If anything, it looked like a crypt or mausoleum, except inside the ossuary, there was no dust or cobwebs or any of the detritus one might expect to see in such a place. It was spotless, the unfurnished stone clean cut and without blemish. Some blank and sterile. The only defining features of the space were the recesses along the walls and the altar in the middle. The altar from which a constant and steady flow of almost absurdly dense and pure death energy continued to flow. Holy memories. This place positively reeks of death magic, Dove exclaimed peering about with his ghostly vision. It's insane. I can feel it trickling into me. I feel stronger. Which is why I didn't want you in here, Tyron said flatly, and the skeleton whirled on him. So I wouldn't get stronger. He exclaimed filled with outrage. Because I don't know what it will do to you the necromancer rebutted. Am I the only one who remembers a particular summoner who insisted on caution and proper testing before playing around with hitherto unknown or unexplored magic? What the fuck? I am that guy. 
The fuck you are. Tyron glared. That dove wouldn't be striding into this room without having the faintest idea what would happen to him. You don't even know where this is. Do you? Dove challenged him, stalking forward to poke Tyron in the chest with one bony finger. Tyron brushed his hand aside. No, I fucking don't. That's why I'm being cautious. Now are you going to leave on your own, or am I going to kick you out? You want me to leave? This place is amazing. Something is happening here, Tyron. There's no way in hell I'm leaving. The necromancer narrowed his eyes. You had a choice. In his weakened state? There was no chance for Dove to resist him in a battle of wills, and Tyron quickly suppressed him before he picked the skeleton up and threw him out the door. He released his hold just as Dove started to come back to himself, scrambling around to glare as Tyron was shutting the door on him. Oh, you motherfuck. Thud. Unbelievable. To think that the man had lost this much of his sense of self-preservation, soaking in all this death magic might empower his soul. It would certainly flood the course Tyron had placed on him but it may also be destructive. Was it possible for a spirit to take in more energy than it contained? Could it hold a corrupting influence? More importantly, where was it coming from? Limitless, free magic was not a thing, and yet here he had a seemingly inexhaustible supply streaming into this cross-dimensional space. It was coming from somewhere. Only extensive research and testing would help him learn what that was. Shaking his head, he forgot about Dove. That idiot would have to cool his heel bones outside for a while. Once again, Tyron inspected every inch of the space, only this time he was in a better state of mind. Leaving no stone unturned, he went slowly and carefully through each recess, each segment of floor, then carefully examined every line and curve of the altar itself. Sadly, this didn't reveal anything new. As it stood, the ossuary was a fairly straightforward place. The only way to gain new information would be to put it to use. He opened the door and stepped outside to find Dove standing with arms folded across his ribs, tapping his foot impatiently. Kerr. He yelled triumphantly, then sighed in relief. I hate leaving a curse half-spoken. Ignoring him, Tyron went and collected some bones, as well as ordering a skeleton to accompany him, while Dove walked alongside, heckling him with questions. Hey, are you going to apologize for that shit? You can't just knock me out. Are you going to let me back in there? By the time he'd made it back to the door, Tyron had run out of patience. Shut up, Dove. No, I won't apologize. No, I won't let you back in. And no, I am never making you a dick. Go away and let me work so I can try and understand this space. So saying, he yanked open the door, shoved his chosen skeleton through the entrance, then slammed it shut. Once he was alone on the other side, he slumped inside. He'd probably been too hard on Dove. But the former summoner's increasing lack of care for his own existence was a worrying trend that Tyron wouldn't allow to endanger his work. Vengeance was a project of far greater importance than the feelings of an undead slayer even if it was his friend and mentor. He ordered the skeleton to wait by the door, as far from the altar as it could get, before he took the collection of bones he had gathered and began to place them inside the recess. What would happen when they were all in place? He was excited to find out. Chapter 170. As it turned out, nothing happened. Tyron haphazardly piled the bones into the recess, and nothing at all occurred. He even utilized the magic eye spell to see if there were any change in the energy, but there was nothing. Curiously, the bones didn't appear to be taking in the ambient death magic either, which they definitely should have been. Curious, Tyron took the time to purge the bones of any built-up magic, using a mat he had designed for this purpose. Even when the bones were totally free from arcane energy, they still refused to take anything in. Curious, interested to see the difference, he turned to his existing minion waiting by the door, and carefully examined it. It turned out this undead was taking in energy. A steady flow of death magic infused its bones, joining the already abundant energy contained within. The conduit placed within its ribsage seemed to act as a doorway or opening, allowing even more of the magic to seep inside, infusing the enchantments woven into the minion, then infusing into the bones, and weaving that made up the creature's body. Was it helping or hurting the minion? Perhaps neither. As far as he understood, there was a saturation limit for undead flesh and bone, a point beyond which they wouldn't take in any more energy. Each of his minions should have reached that point, especially now, after such a long time connected to the conduit network drawing in a steady flow of death energy. 
Perhaps something different was happening here. Or was it a consequence of the purity and density of this arcane energy? Again, as far as he understood, energy was just energy. The richness or abundance or quality shouldn't matter. Quality wasn't even a property of magical energy. Yet his skeleton was absorbing energy. For three hours, he watched and documented the changes as more and more energy accumulated inside the bones of the skeleton, beyond the point he had previously considered fully saturated. Eventually, after about two and a half hours, the skeleton no longer took in more death magic. It stored as it would on the outside, not consuming energy, or taking any in. Its cores were full, its bones were full. Once he was sure nothing more was coming in, and that the skeleton appeared to be stable, he ordered it to run laps around the chamber. It seemed faintly ridiculous, watching a skeleton run in circles. The relatively faint tack 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 of the bones against the stone resonated against the walls as the undead mindlessly and repetitively ran. He was attempting to drain the creature of its energy, but as time wore on, he realized he couldn't. The array, combined with what was flowing into the bones, was simply too much energy. His minion was drawing in more than it was using. Tyron frowned. Interested to see what would happen, he took the minion outside of the ossuary and back to the mountain. Standing still, the undead began to lose energy, leaking it out into the air as the bones began to seek a new equilibrium. This was a stunning development. Several things had now occurred in succession that the young necromancer had no explanation for. Far from being discouraged, he was elated. Whenever he encountered something for which his current understanding couldn't explain, it was a sign that something fundamental in his model was broken. He had to shatter it, and build it up again from the ground up. Moments like this were what he lived for. Fully unaware of the slight smile that creased his lips or the faintly glazed expression that blossomed in his eyes, Tyron turned back into the ossuary. Mind already a buzz. Already, so many questions. An energy tolerance level of bones. The capacity to retain the energy absorbed. The behavior of the energy within the ossuary. Even if he could solve each of those mysteries, the greatest question of all remained. When those solutions were applied, was there a way to make his undead more powerful? All his knowledge needed to be bent to that end. Eager to explore more of the ossuary's capacities, he turned his attention back to the inert bones he had left within a recess on the wall. They remained as he had left them, devoid of any magic at all, resting in a loose pile. Obviously, the ossuary itself was interfering somehow, since it made no sense that the bones wouldn't absorb energy. Even in the wild, bones would begin to take in ambient magic, slowly turning it into death energy, and sharing it with other remains. Here, in this preposterously rich environment, the bones wouldn't take in any energy. It was absurd. The recesses were clearly intended to house a full human skeleton laid out. So that is what he did. Starting with the feet, he carefully sorted the bones and began to put them in their place, moving up the skeleton until at last, he put down the skull. The bones were now laid out in the manner he would place them before beginning to work on the threading. As soon as the skull was in position, Tyron noted a change. Carefully, he stepped back from the recess and cast the magic eye spell, watching the flow of energy like a hawk. The influx of death magic was immediate. In abundance, it flowed from the altar and the center of the room, or more accurately, the gap around the base of it, and into the bones. Now, this was another interesting development. If things continued at this pace, the bones would become fully saturated in a matter of hours. That wasn't necessarily a good thing since it would mean the remains would then begin to form into a wild undead. He frowned. Surely the ossuary was more than just a place he could efficiently infuse remains with energy. He was already doing that a long time ago. All of his current minions had been infused with death magic, and gone as close to full saturation as was possible before they were raised. If this was all these recesses did, then it was a slight time saver, at best. Determined to learn what the end result would be, he took out his notebook, and began to scribble away, trying to get some of the ideas in his head down and onto the page. All the while, he closely monitored the energy flowing into the bones held within the recess. Hours passed and Tyron lost himself to the flow of ideas. Pages became filled with notes, theories, tests, possible solutions and many collections of sigils, as he sought to use what he was sure of to plumb the unknown he was grasping for. Ultimately, it took much longer for the remains to saturate than he'd expected, over four hours. But like the minion he'd brought in before, 
They continued to absorb energy well beyond what he had thought possible. When at last he detected that no more energy was being absorbed by the bones, he tensed. Any second now, or perhaps now, or perhaps not. Tilting his head to the side, Tyron beheld something that should not be. The bones had absorbed more death energy than they should have reasonably held. Even by the standards of this place, they were full. They weren't taking in any more. Yet the process of forming a wild undead did not take place. The strands of magic that formed the sinew and muscle didn't form. No light began to glow within the hollow sockets of the skull. Each individual bone remained as it was, not even twitching. Fascinated, Tyron crept closer, still believing that something should happen. Yet, no matter how long he waited, it did not. For a time, he paced back and forth. He examined the recess again. There were no enchantments, cause or anything that might explain what was happening. For whatever reason, a wild undead refused to form. Tyron ran outside, collected his blanket, threw the bones into them, and waited. Still nothing. He took the bones outside the ossuary and lay the blanket out on the ground. Immediately, two things began to happen. The bones began to leak energy and they began to pull themselves into position, tendrils of magical thread beginning to form between them. How? He said, dumbfounded. Regardless of how, he had his answer. Within the ossuary, wild undead would not form. Before the bones could be wasted, he gathered up the blanket and ran back into his new, confusing dimensional space. Once they were inside, the remains once again became inert. Brow furrowed, Tyron tried to make sense of it. As far as he understood it, the recesses within the ossuary were able to hold remains in a state of perpetual saturation, without the risk of going wild. That was helpful, significantly helpful. However, that only led him to the next mystery. Within the ossuary, the bones were reaching a point where they held more energy than they could sustain on the outside. Something in here was allowing them to take in more than they normally could. If he were able to somehow increase the tolerance level of the remains he worked with, then perhaps they would be able to retain this energy. More death-aligned energy was, from what he'd learned so far, always a good thing. There was an interesting wrinkle, though. When he infused bones to use with his bone forging, they took in a huge amount of energy without leaking it. What was the difference? Was there a qualitative change that occurred when he was forging? If he was required to invest that much energy into each and every minion the process would become far too inefficient. There was no guarantee the supply he had access to here would be bottomless. Frustrated, he scrubbed a hand through his hair and began to pace back and forth once more, hands folded behind his back. There were so many questions. Each step forward only opened more possibilities, each of which would need to be explored, if he was going to be thorough. He needed to test how robust the supply of death magic within the ossuary was. That was, perhaps, simple enough. He already had tools that gathered death magic and purified it. All he needed to do was alter them to store it so that none went to waste. For that, he would need calls. Many, many calls. Thankfully, the supply of kin through the rift was functionally endless. In enough time, he would have the calls he needed. Next, he needed to determine the difference between forged bone and regular bone, especially pertaining to their saturation levels. What would happen if he brought forged bone into the ossuary? Another test for him to conduct. Of course, he had to try and raise minions within the space as well. There may be a difference between those raised within and those raised without. There was only one way to find out. If only the Unseen were a little more verbose in its descriptions. It wasn't the first time he'd had this thought, and he was sure it wouldn't be the last. Although he might be able to learn more when he reached level 45. With access to another ability selection and the full list of feats, he may be able to shed some light on the capabilities of the Oswari. He wouldn't get much, he knew that, but something was better than nothing. Filled with ideas, he left the bones where they lay on the floor and stepped out of the door. Placed above the ritual circle, a constant drain of power was required to keep the entrance in place, but he made sure to keep it topped up. He had no fear of it vanishing before he was ready. Dove intercepted him by the cave. Worked out what's going on in there, he said shortly. Tyron shook his head. Not even remotely. You aren't the only undead who can absorb more energy in there. But it starts to leak out of my skeletons the moment they leave. For whatever reason, they can't retain the power. Dove placed his hands on his bony hips. The same thing happened to me. Whatever extra juice I pulled in was lost when I came out. 
That's interesting. The additional energy my skeletons took in was stored in their bones, which are a natural repository of that energy. But you don't have any bones. The only part of you which is undead is your soul. Which would mean, what? That my soul can act as a container for magic? Dove asked. The skeleton grew still. My soul can be a container for magic, he said slowly. Tyron nodded, suddenly feeling exhausted. There was only so much inspiration a mage could take. Excited, Dove grabbed hold of his shoulders and shook him. Do you know what this means? You get it, right? You fucking get it. The necromancer endured this exuberant treatment. Yes, yes, I get it. If there's magic mixing with the soul then then, then a status ritual should be possible. Stop shaking me please. Filled with energy, Dove leapt away, dancing an absurd little dance, as he flung his bony limbs about, cackling like a madman. Tyron only sighed, then grinned. An irrepressible urgency was building in the back of his mind, and he'd felt it enough times now to recognize it for what it was. It wouldn't be long now until he lost all sense of time as he threw himself into the work, reaching that obsessive state which had led to his best and greatest breakthroughs. With so many parts in front of him, who knew what he would come up with by the time he was done? Chapter 171 Gramble Tillis was running out of patience. You okay, boss? His teammate Christoph asked him. You're looking tense. The two were sat in the split granite, the newer of the two pubs in Cragwhistle. The tables were cleaner, the beer was essentially the same watered down piss, and the spirits were hard enough to scrape coal off a miner. What day is it, Christoph? Gramble said, blinking into his cup. Hamer's Day. A drink to the god of games. Petri, the third team member slurred before he tossed back his drink and winced as it burned down his throat. For a moment, Gramble looked as if he had something to say. Then he shrugged and also emptied his cup. Christoph decided to join them. Anish. Another round for the table Gramble called, waving a hand vaguely over his head. Soon after, a tan-skinned woman wandered over, a hand on her hip and a bottle gripped firmly in the other. She was smiling. Yet her eyes were cautious as she approached. Have you boys not had enough yet? As my father, Dinish, used to say, a man must hold their water, not project it on their friend. She pantomimed a sickly customer, staggering and leaning, hands flapping widely before vomiting hugely over the table. It was a skillful performance, the expression of revulsion on her face, as she pretended to spit out the last of the sick was enough to turn Gramble's stomach. Maybe just the one more round he muttered, a hand resting on his belly, as if to discern its current level of integrity. Of course, you are here to drink, no, Anish said as she leaned over and poured each of them a half cup. Although I'm reluctant to speak of it, my mother, Shiswa, would curse me from the heavens if I left the table without asking you to settle your bill. An unbelievable miser, my mother. She would have shaved rats to weave our clothes if she hadn't feared disease. After a moment of owlish blinking, Gramble figured out what she was saying and fumbled in his pocket, until he felt some coins clinking together. He withdrew his fist, squinted at the currency, until he figured out which coin was which, and passed a few over. I believe that will cover the tab, he said, with some dignity. It will, Anish replied, whisking away from the table so quickly Gramble looked back to his palm, wondering if he'd confused copper with gold. Not that he had much gold. Not at the moment. Stupid necromancer, he grumbled, and his two teammates whipped around and shushed him. Not in town, Christoph hissed. These people are crazy. They'll beat us over the head with clubs if we disparage that prick. Sorry? Sorry, Gramble groaned as he leaned back in his chair, eyes wandering up to the wooden slats in the ceiling above. Stupid necromantic prick, he said. I think we should get out of here, Christoph said, rising from his seat. Gramble stared at him vacantly for a second. Then the light of understanding dawned in his eyes. Oh, sorry. It's fine, let's just get back to the barracks. I've got some wine from home left over in my room. If we want to keep drinking, we can finish that off. Wine? You've still got some wine. That's a hell of a lot better than this swill Gramble declared, perhaps a little too loudly. Christoph managed to ignore the flinty stares he was getting from the other patrons of the pub, long enough to gather up his two teammates and get them swaying back toward the barracks. The next morning, his Gramble emerged from his room, his tongue as dry as the southern sands and head pounding like an anvil at harvest time. He found Samantha, of all people, reading in the common area. Under normal circumstances, he felt like he got along fairly well with his fellow team leader. Better than he and Trinan did, anyway. 
However, he'd soured on all of the slayers on this god's forsaken mountain, since that necromancer had arrived. If any of them had courage, they'd have worked together to kill the bastard the day he'd arrived. Doing his best to preserve his image, he straightened and walked straight for the water cask. With great focus, he gathered a cup, turned the spigot and watched as it filled. A moment before he could raise it to his lips and take a sip, a voice spoke out from behind him. A little worse for wear this morning, Samantha asked with wry humor. Gramble's hands tremored at the interruption, but he felt a surge of triumph that he didn't spill. He savored the victory, he took a long slow mouthful of water before he turned around and opened his mouth to speak. Holy shit, your eyes are red. How much did you drink last night? If he was honest, far too much. A bit he admitted voice a touch on the raw side. Right, she said, as she closed her book with a snap. Samantha was older than the other slayers on the mountain. The only one who wasn't fresh out of academy. A higher level, though not yet a silver, she was most definitely the strongest of them also. He suspected she'd been in a team before becoming the leader of Starfire. What happened to that previous group, he couldn't guess. The walls here aren't all that thin, Gramble. What? The sentence didn't seem to make sense to his still underpowered mind. The walls. They're thin. He looked at the exterior wall, which was formed out of thick cut stone. A moment later, it dawned on him. The walls between rooms were a lot thinner. He groaned. What did I say? He said, walking slowly forward and sinking into a chair. You spent almost the entire night pissing and moaning about Tyron. Who? The necromancer she rolled her eyes. No way was Gramble going to accept that person was the son of Battle Mage Beery. Even the mention of it was enough to stoke his irritation. So, I can complain all I want here in the barracks. Since the townsfolk have all decided to go insane he grumped, folding his arms across his chest. Or have you gone off the deep end with them? You actually believe that's his real name? She hesitated, and in that moment, he knew she was lost. I might she finally hedged. He had a lot to say that was very convincing. Certainly, it doesn't seem to benefit him to lie. Anger bubbled up in the major's chest. And you believe him about the Steelums as well. That Magnan and Beery just killed themselves so their child could live. That they were tortured by the Magisters for refusing to kill their own kid. Samantha held his gaze coolly. It appears you don't she said. Of course I don't. I'm not an idiot. Rather than be offended, she simply raised a brow. You really believe the Magisters wouldn't do something like that? She said, slightly incredulous. Absolutely they would. Just not to them. You think the Magisters cared about the Steelums? Really? Magnin and Beery were heroes, and probably far too strong for the brand to have any effect on them anyway. We're talking about the two strongest slayers in the entire western province. They were above gold rank, for goodness's sake. The last line of defense on the frontier, they prevented disaster how many times? We're meant to believe they were thrown away like that. He scoffed, then flinched at a spike of pain in his head. She listened to his rout with an expression almost like pity coming over her face. Yes, she said simply. They absolutely would do that. There's nothing they won't throw away to maintain control. And you're lucky to have not been put in a position where you've been made to understand that. Suddenly angry, she stood, glaring down at him. You're the only team leader who hasn't gone up there and spoken to him. Do that, at least if you can muster the courage. Rather than stewing in ignorance, you may as well go and see for yourself. I don't need to meet a madman to know he's mad Gramble sneered, waving her away. Everything he said is all the proof I'll ever need. Samantha leaned forward and flicked him, right between the eyes, and the mage's headache exploded, as if a fireball had gone off inside his skull. He lunged back in his chair, clutching at his head. Oh, you bitch he groaned. Go up there, coward. He heard her leave each step in rhythm with the pounding pain behind his eyes. When it finally began to subside, he opened his eyes and found himself alone inside the common area. I'm not a coward he muttered to himself. I'm just the only sensible person on this preposterous mountain. Six hours later, he found himself climbing the steep path toward the rift. How dare she call me a coward? I've been battling kin on this mountain just as much as she has. More even, I was here first. Wrapped in his warmest robe, with a tight woolen hat pulled over his head and a scarf coiled around his neck, Gramble was as warm as he could be. A cold breeze blew down the slope carrying the promise of ice and frostbite. He shivered and tucked his hands further up his sleeves. 
It was difficult to cast magic with gloves on. In fact, Gramble found it impossible to cast magic with gloves on. The weight and range of movement felt completely off whenever he tried it. When even a minuscule shift in angle or position could throw a sigil off, wearing gloves was the same as strapping an anvil to each digit. They simply wouldn't move properly. Which meant, if he wanted to be able to cast magic, he had to keep his hands nimble. That meant no gloves when trekking up the frigid mountain. He hated this place. Not for the first time, he wondered why he was even here. His pride wasn't so tender that being called a coward was enough for him to foolishly stick his neck out. So why? Perhaps it was the ridiculous persistence of Samantha and others on believing that this madman was who he said he was. Gramble wasn't sure how he was supposed to disprove it. The necromancer could say he was the ghost of Telenon if he felt like it. What sort of proof could anyone offer to the contrary? Picking a fight with the necromancer certainly wasn't on the agenda. There were some battles that simply weren't worth losing. No, if there was to be a fight, then Gramble would much rather have the advantage of numbers on his side. Perhaps he simply needed to prove it to himself. He would meet this impostor, go back down the mountain, and tell Samantha to her face she was wrong. That was all there was to it. The fact that so many slayers and villagers had come up and made it back down alive certainly didn't hurt his confidence either. Step by step, he continued to climb the slope, making sure he didn't slip on the rocks or frosted ground. Every now and again, he reached out to grasp a tree or take hold of a branch, using the ice-tinged timber to pull himself forward. Thunder rumbled in the distance, indicating a brewing storm higher up. He cursed. If he was caught in the rain, it would be hell getting back down the mountain. Perhaps it would have been a better idea to wait until he was in better condition before charging up the mountain. Now that he was already here, he felt he was committed. At the minimum, he should have brought the rest of his team along with him. Feeling somewhat exposed, Gramble grit his teeth and powered onward, shivering inside his cloak. Eventually, he came across what he had been expecting to see. A line of five skeletons stood astride the path, unmoving and indifferent to the wind. Seeing the bones standing upright, weapons gripped tight in their skeletal fingers, sent a shiver running down his spine, totally independent of the temperature. Eyes glowing with an unnatural purple light, the undead beheld him as Gramble nervously pulled himself up. I'm here to speak to your master, he said, somewhat pompously. They didn't react. In fact, they didn't move, not even a twitch. Unsure what to do, Gramble waited for some sort of response. He glanced between the skeletons, huddled with his arms wrapped around himself, growing increasingly impatient. Supposedly, the necromancer was able to see through the eyes of his minions. So what was the holdup? Was he being ignored? Before his ire could rise too high, he considered that there may be other possibilities. Perhaps the necromancer was otherwise occupied, or weakened. For a moment, Gramble considered his options, before he walked sidewise off the path. When he picked his way across the slope around 10 meters, he turned back and saw there had been no reaction from the skeletons. They stood as before, staring straight down the path, unmoving. Clearly, their creator was distracted. Moving cautiously, he began to ascend up the mountain, joining back up to the path once he passed the skeletal watches. With renewed vigor, he began to ascend once more, eager to see what was happening further up. He wondered what might be happening to keep this illegal mage so occupied. Once he felt he was close to where the necromancer's camp must be, he began to move quietly. If he was able to arrive unnoticed, he'd have a chance to assess what he saw before taking a course of action. After all, who knew what he might find? If the mage was engaged in a ritual, distracted, unable to utilize his magic in his own defense. For a brief moment, Gramble allowed himself to imagine it. A moment of triumph returning to the town a conquering hero, laughing in the faces of the people who'd spurned him after slaying their hero. Of course, it wouldn't be that easy. He hadn't graduated and fought as a slayer, without gaining a healthy sense of self-preservation. The fact he was even here, alone, on the mountain, was out of character. If he hadn't been provoked, not for the first time, he cursed Samantha in his mind. Still ranting about the cold-faced slayer in his mind, he stumbled past a tree and into a clearing. The necromancer stood in the center of his ritual circle side onto Gramble's position, power blazing around him. Gramble's eyes boggled as he saw the mage snapping out sigils with unbelievable speed and precision. When he opened his mouth and spoke, each syllable was like thunder, cracking into the air with incredible force. This was the storm he'd heard. It wasn't lightning, 
It was this man casting magic. By the side of the necromancer, a pitch black skeleton stood, looking on. Gramble had heard of this one, a freakish, foul-mouthed undead. Whoever's soul was stuck inside it. It sounded like he'd earned his fate. Almost against his will, Gramble felt his eyes drawn back to the necromancer as he continued to enact his ritual. The movement, the flow of power, the flawless pronunciation. Everything was textbook, an extreme display of precision that put even his own instructors to shame. It was beautiful. He shook his head. The necromancer was vulnerable, just as he had hoped. No matter how excellent a mage he was, there was nothing he could do to defend himself in the middle of casting a ritual. Gramble raised his hands and began to form his magic, a fireball, with as much power as he could pack into it. The moment it was prepared, a burning, whirling sphere of power in his hand, he flung it forward with a roar of triumph. So what if he was silver rank? No mage could survive a direct hit from a spell like this. What happened next defied belief. No matter how many times he replayed the sequence of events in the future, he refused to accept it was real. Without pausing the flow of words from his mouth, the necromancer separated his hands and began to cast independently. The right hand picked up the slack, flicking out abbreviated half-sigils at double speed, while the other flicked out a series in less than a second. Gramble's fireball hadn't covered half the ground between them before it was pierced through the middle by a bolt of pure darkness, unbalancing the magic and causing it to detonate early. Gramble fell back as a wave of heat washed over him, mind frozen in shock. It wasn't it wasn't possible. That simply it wasn't human. You piece of fucking shit. It was the black skeleton, screeching at the top of its voice as it sprinted towards him. It pulled back a fist, then struck down, and Gramble knew no more. Outside the gates of Cragwistle, Trinan could only sigh as he looked down at what the skeletons had left behind. When the villagers had called, he hadn't wanted to believe it. But here he was. In front of him, staring up with tears in his eyes, Gramble lay, tied up with a series of elaborate knots, including one through his mouth, preventing him from speaking. Anth. He grunted. Yeah, yeah, I'll get you out. Attached to the chest of the Slayer, held in place with one strand of rope, was a bit of paper. Leaning down, Trinum pulled it loose, and read it, feeling a little confused. He looked down at Gramble. You are a fucking lucky idiot, he said, turning the note around and showing it to the trust up Slayer. I'm busy, was all it said. Chapter 172. I can't believe it. I can't fucking believe it, Dove breathed. Tyron swayed on his feet and blinked owlishly. Now that the goal was close, the frenetic energy that had possessed him for the past week was beginning to fade. Already, he could feel a headache blooming in his temples, and the dryness of his mouth and eyes was gradually becoming a major issue. Souls are weird, he said slowly, before he turned and began to rummage through his pack. He needed food, water and roughly 18 hours of sleep. Dove laughed, an uncomfortable, frenetic edge to the sound. You just outdid yourself in terms of genius bullshit, and that's your offering. Souls are weird. Well, they are, Tyron muttered before shoving a wedge of cheese into his mouth. Quickly, he spat it out. It was going rancid. He rinsed out his mouth, then took a long drink from his water skin. The fluid was brackish and far from fresh. But to his parched throat, it was like the tears of the goddess. Spirits, souls and ghosts were his weakest subjects, as it were, when it came to necromancy. He'd spent almost all of his time studying bones, artificial mental constructs, death magic, He'd had almost no reason or interest to investigate the souls of the living. Outside of his revenants, he didn't even have any ghosts in his entourage currently. Yet, when it came to this particular problem, an intricate and detailed knowledge of the soul had been necessary to succeed. So the majority of the week had been spent finding and then examining ghosts. Even possessed by the spirit of inspiration as he had been, Tyron had found that the rules governing the souls of the dead were weird. Dove was dancing, wiggling his bony hips in obscene motions, and giggling like a young maid. Of all the stupid bullshit you've pulled off, this is by far the stupidest and most bullshit laden of them all. Where the fuck do you get off figuring this stuff out? It's nonsense. I was here to watch you do it, and I still don't know how you did it. The necromancer waved a hand carelessly as he continued to drink and eat. The negative effects of such a long stint of ceaseless work continued to build but he hoped to ward them off before they grew too severe. We aren't even sure if it's going to work, he stated, his throat still raw. Seated in the cave in the dead of night, 
The wind rustling in the trees was their only companion. A small fire crackled near the entrance providing some warmth, and several globes of magical light gave all the illumination they required. Tyron's small table was covered in loose sheets of paper, each filled with a dense, almost illegible scroll. With a groan, he picked himself up and felt every muscle in his body protest at the motion. Damn it all, it wasn't easy for his muscles to get stiff and sore like this. Even at his level of endurance, an entire week of casting spells and sitting hunched over his notes was enough. In moments like this, being a lick didn't seem like all that bad of an idea. No need to sleep, eat or drink. He could work for months on end without any need for a break. Efficiency wise, it would be a real time saver. Certainly better than being a vampire, at least. For starters, sleeping half the time was an enormous waste. Secondly, every vampire he'd seen was often diverted with other concerns rather than focused on their goals. If the Dark Ones got their way, he certainly wouldn't remain a human for long, judging by the feats they'd offered him. Something to worry about another time. There was no way he was going to get any sleep until Dove had attempted the new ritual, so he may as well let him have his fun. Let me talk you through it one more time, then we can make an attempt, alright? He croaked before taking another swig of water. It's not that complicated, kid. I could do this with one hand up my ass. For good measure. The skeleton reached around and inserted his hand into his pelvis from the back, wiggling his fingers. If something goes wrong and you rip your soul apart, at least you can't say I didn't warn you of the risks he insisted, ignoring Dove's antics. Sit your bony backside down, and I'll walk you through it. So saying, he pulled out the chair and indicated for Dove to sit, then began to rifle through the sheets of paper, trying to create some semblance of order, so he could present it. Starting from the beginning he coughed. Oh shit, really? Shut up. Starting from the beginning. So the status ritual, we know essentially what it does. It takes the Unseen's assessment of you, then codifies it. The information is contained within the blood, so it isn't even extracted. We use the medium of blood to manifest the information contained inside it. So all the ritual has to do is ask the Unseen to reveal itself, which it willingly does. He paused for a minute to take a drink and work up some more moisture in his mouth while Dove bounced in his seat impatiently. In many respects, the current ritual we use is performing the task in the simplest possible way. Which is why any idiot can cast it. Your situation is a little different. Yes, I'm dead. Therefore, no blood. I think I got that part. Is it really necessary to explain it? If you talk less and listen more, this goes faster. Do you want it to go faster? If Dove could roll his eyes, he certainly would at this moment. Yes, Professor Steelham, you're insufferable. Now, at this point, you're going to say that. You've always been insufferable. Now shut up. Without blood to work as a universal medium for the unseen to encode information into, we were pretty stuck. We determined there was magic inside your soul, which was a breakthrough. But that didn't mean there was information contained inside. So we had to find a way to examine the magical contents of the soul, so to speak. This process had been a great deal more difficult than Tyron made it seem. He had limited ways to examine souls. Eventually, he'd been able to cobble something together using cannibalized parts of the commune with spirit spell and the repository ritual. Effectively, he'd substantiated a soul and then selected a medium to deposit the magical information from the soul into. Most of the time, he'd used his own blood. Luckily, the Unseen is thorough in its work, Dove remarked, somewhat sarcastically. It infects everything equally. Tyron hesitated, but didn't say anything. Was the Unseen a savior or a curse? That question would haunt the people of this realm long after he was dead, just as it had for millennia before he was born. Wherever there was magic, the Unseen was present, and after thousands of years of the realm being saturated with arcane power from the rifts, magic was in everything, including, apparently, souls. So this section of the ritual is there to provide a shell through which the ritual can access your soul, I guess. That's kind of clumsy phrasing. I agree. But I don't have better terminology, I'm afraid. It opens a soul hole. I hate you. Never say that in my presence again. This construct acts as a receptacle through which we can access the magic within the soul. Then this section mimics that magic, effectively creating a copy. Then we encode that information into our medium of choice. You've lost a lot of blood this week. Have you even got any juice left? 
I'll be fine. At that point, my own information should be overwritten, and the final part of the ritual will work much the same as the traditional one. Great. The risk is, your soul actually ruptures when we try to open it. Or the magic contained within won't resonate with the copy we've made, so any choices you make during the status ritual won't take effect. Nobody's ever worked out how that shit works, the Unseen pretty much does all of that itself. Which is why I have no idea if this ritual will actually work or not. Whatever, I'm still willing to give it a try. It's not like I have a lot to live for, so is this even really a risk? Well, if your soul explodes, you won't get to go to wherever souls go when a person dies. I reserved a spot on Celine's left tit. Sure you did. There, you have the method, you know the risks. Tyron pulled a knife from his belt and pricked the tip of finger. The blood was slow to come, so he pushed and squeezed, until a healthy number of drops had fallen and stained the clean sheet of paper on the table. When you're ready he said, withdrawing his hand. Dove, as a spirit inhabiting what was effectively a cunningly carved statue, did not need to breathe in any way. Yet, in this moment, he made the sound of a long slow inhalation, as he readied himself. Perhaps it was simply a habit he wasn't rid of. Taking a steadying breath was something people did all the time. Or perhaps Dove was simply trying to settle himself as a rare flutter of emotion perturbed his cold spirit. Regardless, a beat later, he began to speak, his hands flicking out the familiar gestures with practiced ease. Throughout the process, Tyron held his breath, gripped by a heady mix of fatigue and anticipation. Had he failed Dove at the final hurdle? Had he made magical history by inventing brand new magic? With the added components, this was a much longer and more complex ritual than the standard one. But Dove breezed through it, completing the process in under five minutes. The instant he completed the ritual, several things happened at once. Dove leaned forward eagerly, his hollow, glowing eyes staring down at the page in front of him. The blood, ever so slowly, began to move. Tyron's eyes rolled up in his head as he became gripped by a sudden vision. As soon as he began to awaken, the details of what he saw began to fade. He'd been somewhere somewhere else. Intangible presences, like ribbons of mist, had twined themselves around him whispering begging. What they'd said was important, very important, but he just couldn't remember. The harder he tried to reach out and grasp the memories, the faster they slipped away from him, until he was left grasping nothing and his eyes opened. H-R-R-R-R-R, he slurred, his tongue feeling heavy in his mouth. His head was pounding, his vision was blurry. How long had he been out? A vision. He'd experienced a vision. That must mean he'd unlocked a new mystery, which meant he must have been successful, hadn't he? What had happened when the ritual ended? Finally awake. Welcome back, kid. Tyron swiveled his head and saw Dove in front of him, his eyes finally deciding to focus. Then, he realized a few other things. Dove he rasped, why am I tied to the chair? The skeleton stood tall, wearing his armor, hands resting on his bony hips. I'm not going back, kid he said seriously. I know you have to leave soon, and there is no fucking way I'm going back to your... Not now that I finally have a reason to continue existing, I guess. It took a few moments for what was being said to sink in, but Tyron seized on the key point. It worked. He breathed, a grin blossoming on his face. I was right. Dove leaned forward, his head tilted to one side. You just got a fucking mystery, didn't you? Another mystery? I should say, you fucking prick. Tyron shrugged defensively, which was difficult with his arms tied behind his back. I could have made a breakthrough that was sufficient to be granted a vision, but not enough for the ritual to work as intended. I didn't see what happened. How was I supposed to know? He tested his bonds. Dove had done a suspiciously expert job tying him up. I know what you're thinking. I've got rope tying at level 10. And now he had access to those skills again. I'll tell you when you're older, Dove said, and it appeared as though he attempted to wink. He wasn't successful. Was it really necessary to tie me up? Tyron grumbled. You could have just run away when I went to sleep. This is way more fun. That and I wasn't sure if you would let me go. Tyron raised a brow at him questioningly, and Dove flapped his arms in a defensive motion. I know you made a deal with your to bring me out here. I don't know what the terms are, but you'll get kicked in the balls if I don't come back. I'm sure of that. Generally, you've tried to do the right thing by me, but... He trailed off. But you were worried I wouldn't be willing to pay that price, 
and that I'd drag you back against your will the necromancer finished for him. Maybe he would have, maybe he still would. After wrestling with the idea for a few moments, he slumped in his seat. It's fine he muttered, you can go. This is the last time I'm going to do you a favor like this, alright? As unfortunate as your situation is, I've got a few things I need to deal with as a matter of urgency. Oh, I fucking get it. I hate the Magisters to death, and they didn't torture murder my fucking family. I support the mission 100%. I just don't want to spend another second as some vampire addicted idiot's ball bag. If you're was pissed at what I said, fine. I've done my time. Now I can level again. Now I have access to everything that I'd lost. I refuse to lose this opportunity. There was an intensity to his voice, a manic, possessed energy that perhaps only someone who'd gone through life and death, the way that Dove had could truly understand. Tyron didn't grasp it, but he felt the power of it. What's your plan, then? Are you going to hang around the mountain, hunting kin here in order to get levels? I think Dove mused, as he tapped a finger to his chin, that I'm better off not saying, just in case your demands the truth out of you. I'll be somewhere, doing something. How about that? Tyron rolled his eyes. Fine. Leave a message in Cragwhistle if you want to get in touch with me. Just don't be doing any massacres or zombie uprisings. If you ruin my revenge, don't think you'll get away lightly. The last was said with complete sincerity, and Dove hastened to reassure him. Not a problem. I get it. What class did you get anyway? It's on the table if you want to look, you pervert. Says the guy with rope tying ten. Will you let me out of here now? No, so long, kid, until the next time I see your brooding mug. Take care of yourself, Dove. If you want to stay alive, I suppose. I wonder. Finally, the skeleton turned to leave, then turned back. I used to think you were a once-in-a-century genius, you know. Then I thought you were a once-in-a-millennium genius. Now, I'm not certain this realm has ever seen anything like you before. Don't fuck up, Tyron. You could tip this entire realm over if you play your cards right. That's the general idea, Tyron smiled fiercely. Then Dove turned, and he was gone. Chapter 173 it wasn't too difficult for Tyron to extricate himself. Although, technically speaking, he didn't. His closest minions weren't far away, and were more than capable of severing the rope for him. Perhaps that did count as doing it himself a consideration for another time. Experiencing a vision from the unseen was not the same thing as resting, so Tyron remained utterly exhausted. Once he was free, he decided to wash himself, drink water and eat before he retired for an extended nap. For security, he pulled the majority of his minions closer to the cave, ensuring his revenants were on the front lines to hold off the worst of the kin while he slept. There was still so much that remained for him to do. He wanted to see Dove's status sheet, he wanted to perform the ritual himself and see what he'd gained, but for now, he allowed himself to put it all from his mind and rest. Well, he used a spell to force it from his mind so he could rest. Tyron awoke feeling sore and as dry as a bone. A week of effort and deprivation wouldn't be so easy to overcome, even for him. Thankfully, his head felt clearer. After splashing his face with icy water and tending to his hunger, he felt somewhat better. By the end of the day, he'd be back to normal, but for now, he was able to function just fine. With a sigh, Tyron released the iron grip he placed on his curiosity, and raced back to the cave, where he snatched up the sheet of paper on the table, still smeared in his dried blood. Dubbed Levin, through death, you have returned to continue the struggle. Duty is the chain that binds you, anger is the fuel that drives you. Power over the arcane has always been your goal, and through it, you will exert your will once more. You have gained the class. Spectral Summoner. Conjure forth others to fight on your behalf. The creatures of the Astral Sea will reject a being such as yourself. But those who dwell in the realm of the dead will answer your call. To increase your proficiency, contract with the denizens of that dread place and summon them to battle on your behalf. Class attributes per level. Intelligence plus one. Wisdom plus one. Manipulation plus three. Skills granted level 1. Dead Sight. Spells granted level 1. Spirit Contract. Appeal to the Dead. I knew Dove wasn't his real name, the prick Tyron muttered. It appeared Dove had been reset to level 1 with his rather dramatic change in lifestyle. His general skills still applied, and they were quite varied, as well as being well trained. It seemed the former summoner had expended some feats to raise the cap on some of his general skills, though there were some questionable choices. 
Although those remained, nothing else did. All the stats he would have gained from his summoner and subclass levels were gone. Even his race levels as a human were gone, as his species had changed to spirit construct. Goodness knows what the advantages of that were. Hopefully, Dove would figure it out before long. He was still in a weakened position, stripped of almost all of his power. But at least now he could do something about it. It was unfortunate, but none of the kin he'd managed to defeat had counted as experience since he hadn't possessed a class at the time. At least from this point forward, he could progress. Although he'd need to find another source of blood. That wasn't Tyron's problem. Dove had struck out on his own, and frankly, it was a load off his mind. Now he had more time and attention to spend on the things he needed to focus on. Namely, getting more powerful. The past week of distraction hadn't been kind to Tyron's minions. He burned Dove's status sheet and brushed the blanket protecting the entrance to the cave aside as he went to assess the damage. With his focus elsewhere, he hadn't paid as much attention to the Rifkin assaults, which meant his skeletons had been more or less left to fend for themselves. This was obviously suboptimal. He'd lost two dozen minions, and many others were heavily damaged. As he ordered his skeletons and scared over the losses, inspecting each squad in turn, he realized it would be necessary to conduct rather extensive repairs on at least 50 skeletons before they could leave. If he took such weakened minions into the rift on the journey back to Kenmore, the risk they wouldn't survive the journey would rise precipitously. Tyron wasn't so enamored with the process of creating undead. He would risk 50 minions. If he worked without pause, it would take him 10 hours of grueling work to repair all the damage. With a growl, he set his revenants, who had thankfully been protected by their now battered armor, and his healthiest squads to guard the mountain trail, while he set up a work area and set to his task. Trennan was not having a good day. Slayers were not the most disciplined of people when they weren't in the field. He knew that. Everyone knew that. But it turns out that when they weren't able to massacre Rivkin to blow off steam, they became positively unruly. Arthur, troll he said, infinite weariness audible in his voice. I'm sorry you got bored of fucking. For the love of the divines. I don't know why you told me this information, and I do not want to know. I'm having a hard enough time stopping Bridget from chopping down someone in the street. If I have to worry about you two as well, I might just lose my fucking mind. Stolen novel, please report. We are bored, Chol said, her arms folded across her chest. There is nothing to do, and I am even starting to grow tired of my precious Arthur's company. I never thought I would say that. That's hurtful, but accurate Arthur concurred. The man had a slightly glazed expression, as if he was staring into the world he would rather inhabit. We're crammed into these barracks and people are getting fractious. The weavers are so pissy they'll screech at you if you drop a pin. What do you want me to do about it? Trinan growled. You think you've got it rough. Imagine being one of the people responsible for keeping this ship afloat. Rent hotel rooms on the opposite side of town and take up a hobby. Knit or something. I don't fucking care. He stood looming over the two mages. The necromancer should be leaving soon. And then we can get back to doing what we do best. Killing kin. Until then, the only thing I ask is that you stay out of fucking trouble. It's not that hard. We've been good Arthur Snat. It's been a month Trennan. A month. As much as it annoyed him, Arthur made a point. He and Chol had, much as they'd said, spent most of their time shacked up drinking and shagging. Pretty much all the Slayers had. But even that wasn't able to hold their interest indefinitely. Slayers were people who literally grew stronger from killing monsters. If they weren't progressing toward their next milestone, or grinding their skills and abilities, then they tended to get antsy. Especially low-ranked slayers like the ones on this mountain. The whole barracks was a powder keg on the verge of exploding. He only hoped nobody did anything stupid and got all of them killed. Sorry, he said to Arthur. I just don't have a lot of patience right now. Samantha and I have been taking turns keeping watch over the gate at night to make sure nobody tries to attack the necromancer again. I'm a little sleep deprived. The two mages appeared surprised to learn this. Has anyone had a go? Chol asked. Not since Gramble, thank fuck. It was only a matter of time, though. Just as he was contemplating how much he hated his life right now, he felt a tap at his shoulder. Shoving his irritation down, Trennan turned and saw a nervous-looking townsman, a regular who served on the wall. Philip, what can I do for you? He said, somewhat politely. Ah, someone is at the gate to see you. Trennan immediately focused. 
When you say someone, he trailed off. The clearly frightened man managed a shaky nod. That was all he needed to hear. Trennan set off at a run and found Orton already waiting for him. Extending a hand, he shook the man's hand briefly, before the two of them stepped through the narrow opening in the gate. On the other side, they found the necromancer, accompanied by what appeared to be his entire cohort of skeletons. Lined up in neat ranks, they were like an army, each wielding their dread weapons of bone, and headed by the terrifying Revenants. Covered in his dark robe and skeletal armor, the mage was an intimidating sight. He stepped forward, moving to the front of his undead, but not leaving their protective ring entirely. Trennan, Orton, nice to see the two of you again. Tyron Orton said, which caused one of Trennan's brows to twitch. I'm going to assume you called us here for a reason. There was obvious fear in his tone, and it took a second for the Slayer leader to realize why. He thought the necromancer was about to wipe out the town. With a chill, Trennan realized he could do it easily, if he wanted to. Against this many skeletons, not to mention the powerful mage who controlled them, they wouldn't stand a chance. As if sensing their fear, the man held up his hands, palm outwards. I come in peace, he chided the large townsman. Orton, you really think I'm going to murder everyone at this point? Come on. I was a little worried when I saw all the skeletons Orton forced a chuckle. I figured if I came unprotected, I'd likely be jumped by a dozen pissed off slayers the mage replied, casting a glance at Trennan, who shrugged. Tempers are getting short, he stated. And fair enough too. I just wanted to let you know that I'm leaving. I'll be traversing the rift, which should put a damper on the number of kin leaking through for about half a day. But you'll be back in business after that. That's good news, Trenner said, a little surprised. Deep down, he wasn't sure if he'd really believed they would all get out of this alive. I'll be back, of course, the necromancer grinned, immediately dampening his spirits again. But you'll have a couple of months to yourselves before I return. Well, that was something at least. If anyone advises you to set up a trap for me, maybe try and persuade them to abandon the idea the mage suggested. Things worked out amicably this time. I'd like to keep it that way. I'm not in control, Trennan told him honestly. I'm not able to prevent anything. Well, give it a go. You should also think about the things I said. Carefully. About rebellion, or about your origins. The rebellion, mostly the necromancer said, it's only going to grow over the next year, and you'll be caught up in it by the time I get back. If you want some advice, start training up a few promising villagers, Orton can recommend some people. They aren't restricted by the brand, and so long as Paranus is in charge, you'll be covered by false paperwork. Trennan felt distinctly uncomfortable. I don't have any love for the magisters, he said, which was true. But, I'm not sure if a rebellion is really a good idea. It doesn't matter what you think, it's happening. So you say. The man nodded thoughtfully. That's true. You don't really have much evidence other than my word for it. I can only tell you that is going to change, and soon. People are going to come. Slayers, volunteers, that sort of thing. Cragwhistle is as far from the Empire's control as it is possible to get and it has a shiny new rift to train unbranded soldiers with. It won't be long until you have to pick a side, Trennan, and I hope you pick correctly. It'd be a shame for you to die so young. With a wave, the mage turned to leave, but Trennan called out before he got far. Show me your status sheet, he said. Show me that, and I'll believe you. The necromancer turned back, a frown on his face. He appeared to consider for a time before he responded. Fine, he said. When I get back, I'll show you. Why not now? Trennan challenged. Because I'll have choices to consider, and I want to make sure I hit my next threshold before I conduct the ritual, came the irritated reply. That was fair. Nobody wanted others looking over their shoulder. Or worse, potentially sabotaging the ritual, and costing them precious class selections. See you in a bit. The skeletons silently turned on their heels and began to march away the mage in their midst. Soon, they were lost amongst the trees, no longer able to be seen. Trennan and Orton shared a glance before both released a long breath. I don't really want to do this again, Orton groaned. Trennan turned to head back to the barracks. He had good news to share. Doesn't seem like we get a choice. Chapter 174 the journey through the rift was as brutal as Tyron recalled. Freezing cold temperatures, a seemingly permanent hail of ice and snow, along with the endless roaming packs of kin, savaging the remnants of their fallen world. It was difficult not to consider what that place might have been, 
before the rifts had overcome it. A thought that naturally led to another. What would his own world be like, when naught but monsters were left to inhabit it? Such a day appeared closer than ever, given how little the administration that held up the empire seemed to care about preventing it. A rift break was a permanent increase in the amount of magic flowing into the realm, yet the magisters had allowed one to occur with such callous ease. The lives lost in the tragedy were one thing, but the permanent risk to the stability of their world was another. Tyron was forced to consider the possibility that he had less time than he might have assumed to enact his revenge. A part of him had wondered if he might focus his attention on becoming a lick, freeing himself from a human lifespan, and spending a hundred years quietly mustering his strength. Now, he dismissed the idea. Given how incompetent they were, a real chance existed that the western province would fall to ruin within that span of time. Through the ice, he traveled until he came upon the point he had originally emerged from the abyss. With enormous difficulty, he conducted the ritual once more, piercing the veil and creating a bridge into that void realm. Whispers teased and taunted him, prying at the edges of his sanity every second he remained in that place, and Tyron was visibly shaking when he finally emerged. The remote building remained just as he had left it, and the hundreds of skeletons filed through the opening, suspended across his ritual circle without incident. When every minion and all supplies had been accounted for, he allowed himself, at last, to relax. The journey was done, he had succeeded in his aims. It was night on the Orton estate, something he was grateful for. Under cover of darkness he marched along with his horde of undead back to the main building, before he was forced to leave them by the fence, which he had to climb to knock on the door and ask for someone to open the cellar. He was received with all the grace he might have expected. Back again. Are you? Rita Orton sniffed, looking him up and down. Tyron stared back flatly. You'd rather I'd died? He asked. Didn't say that, did I? The old woman muttered, though she certainly didn't deny it. You seem to blame me for your god's interest in my fate, he observed. Though, I suppose you can't really blame them, even if you should. She scowled at him. That disrespect is exactly why I don't like you, she snapped. Some things are sacred. Not to me. I need to open the cellar. Fine. Filled with ire, she turned to fetch the key before throwing it at him through the open door. He caught it barely, before nodding his thanks. If you're hungry you can have whatever is left in the pot she called after him. I won't be bothering the staff this late. It took a little time to store his skeletons and revenants away. They needed to be packed fairly tight in order to fit. Only after he'd closed and locked the door, did he stop to wonder how Rufus, Laurel and the others must feel, being shut away in the darkness unable to control their own limbs without his permission. Perhaps he was growing callous, to not even think of it. He wouldn't go so far as to say they deserved their fate, perhaps nobody deserved to live as an undead, but he did not waste time lamenting it either. The stew was still warm, wonder of wonders, and he gladly drank it down before finding a cot in a spare room. After he woke, feeling refreshed for the first time in what felt like weeks, he stepped out of his room, still half asleep, trying to head outside to relieve his bladder. Once he'd found his relief and woken up a little, he realized what the strange looks he'd been given on the way out meant. He hadn't been disguising his face. The realization struck so hard he stopped dead in his tracks, a hand rising to obscure his features. After just a month without it, he'd grown so lax. A disturbing thought. He'd worn it more or less constantly, for years. And now he walked around showing his features openly, so close to Kenmore, cursing himself as foolish. He immediately formed it again, the false mask bringing with it a sense of comfort and control. When he found Rita Orton in her office, she blinked taking a moment to process who he was now his face had changed. And here I thought you may have made a permanent switch she said, pushing her paperwork to one side. I'm half surprised you recognized me last night. How long has it been since you saw my real face? I do my best to remember the people I've met. It's a courtesy she emphasized the latter part more than was necessary. Perhaps you could seek to emulate this sort of behavior. Tyron didn't care to argue with her. I need a carriage back to the city. The sooner the better. The venerable wishes to speak with you. The necromancer's brow twitched with irritation. Why? I ask that same question. Why did that old man want to waste his time now? There were better things to be doing than conversing with a fossil. Hadn't he done enough to please those gods lately? Were they punishing him somehow? Where is he? Tyron growled. I don't have time to waste. 
Speaking with the venerable is never a waste of your time, Mrs. Orton said, eyes blazing. He is holy, and I've no idea why he deigns to speak to you at all, but he does. Show him some respect. If you encounter this story on Amazon, note that it's taken without permission from the author. Report it. With effort, Tyron took hold of his irritation. There was no benefit in going out of his way to be obstinate. His parents were buried on this family's lands. He offered a short bow. I will show due deference, he promised. Where may I speak with the venerable? Though she looked entirely skeptical of his change in attitude, Mrs. Orton, mistress of the estate, directed him to a gazebo near the hill the east-facing side of which housed the vineyard. There he found the venerable, impossibly ancient-looking man that he was, wrapped in a blanket, warming himself with the rising sun. Heard your trip went well, he wheezed in his thin voice. A divine messenger then. I only just got back, Tyron replied, sitting opposite across from a low, round table. Oh, the gods rarely speak to anyone directly, the old man chuckled. I wonder what it's like to be them, sometimes. Are they like us, looking down on ants? Are they even able to tell us apart from that great height? I think they can, but are unlikely to be bothered Tyron replied after considering for a moment. In his experience, the dark gods could achieve many things, but seldom exerted the effort. It was almost their defining feature. You may be right the venerable mused, rubbing at his chin with one gnarled hand. How often do you spend time trying to name the ants you see? You either step on them, or step over them as you go about your day. Imagine how strange it must have been, when five of these ants get big, bigger than any ant has ever been before, and they crawl up to these three humans, and demand they be human too. He shook his head. The three must have laughed like they never had before. I'm not certain they're laughing now, Tyron said. Considering the effort they're having to exert marshalling their ants to oust the gods they created. I've no doubt this is another game to them, a diversion. But that doesn't mean it isn't to our benefit. The venerable leaned forward, staring into Tyron's eyes. Do you ever wonder why, when the entire empire is gripped in the hands of the divines, why things are still so shit? The realm is shrinking, not growing, incursions of magic get stronger every year. It's been five millennia since the divines were raised to their post. The empire they forged is holding together, barely, and their descendants still rule the roost. But our world is dying. After speaking with such intensity, the old man ran out of breath and slumped back in his chair, wheezing. Tyron gave him a minute to collect himself. Our world had a name, once. Do you know it? I almost never hear it spoken anymore the venerable side. Tyron blinked. No, he said, no, I don't believe I do. How could that be? All the time he'd spent reading, learning history. History of the Empire. He realized the Empire and its neighbors. To Tyron, there had never been any world beyond that. They try very hard to make sure people don't realize what they've lost. The venerable nodded shrewdly. The circle grows smaller every year. Granin fell. And now the west is blocked by the barrier mountains, as if we never used to cross them. As if there wasn't trade and exchange for centuries, millennia. To the south is an ocean we haven't crossed in a thousand years. To the north, two thousand since we ventured beyond the barren wilds. We don't have a world anymore, we have an empire. One by one, the outer provinces will fall, until only the center remains. Brow furrowed, the venerable glared out across the fields, as if they personally had offended him. I believe the old gods are taking steps for one simple reason. The fate of this world was always supposed to be in the hands of those who live here, but that power has been stolen from us. The divines have crippled us and set us on a path of slow decline. When they are overthrown, the people will be able to fight to really fight. Then we might be able to save something after all. It was possible. The old gods were consistent in their belief that people help themselves, after all. It was supposed to be within each individual's power to fix their circumstances. Of course, that wasn't always true. Sometimes it wasn't within a person's power. And the old gods loved to tip that balance back the other way. In this case, they themselves had tipped the scales against every living thing in the realm. Though perhaps they hadn't realized it at the time. Now, perhaps they were finally moved to correct their mistake. I heard there was quite the gathering of followers over in Cragwistle, the Venerable said. I suppose I'll have to head over there and show my face. He grinned, his leathery skin pulling back into a thousand wrinkles. Don't tell Mrs. Orton it was my idea. She'll murder me in my sleep. 
Would I do a thing like that? The old man chuckled, a twinkle in his eye. Two days by carriage and truthfully, Tyron slept most of the way. Should he have been theorizing, writing and scheming? Probably, yes. But there would be plenty of time for that once he returned to his shop. If anything, a little rest would fortify him for the time to come. And so, he allowed himself to eat, drink and doze the days away. Until he was startled from his rest one day, and found the great walls of Kenmore rising in the distance. After settling accounts with the coach driver, he made his way into Shea Town, and soon enough, he walked through the door of Armsfield Enchantments. For a moment, he felt a strong sense of cognitive dissonance, as if the store he stood in belonged to a stranger, as well as himself. Tyron recognized the sensation for what it was. After finally throwing off the identity of Lucas Armsfield, it was slower to come back than he'd expected. How much had he secretly yearned to be Tyron Steelham again? To be open and honest about the rage and hate that bubbled away in the core of him. When Seri jumped around the counter and bounced up to him, a broad smile on her face. The feeling began to fade, and the persona of Lucas slipped around him like a cloak. Master Armsfield, welcome back. She cheered, loud enough to draw Flynn from the back room. The apprentice poked his nose around the corner, looking equal parts relieved and nervous, as he saw his employer had returned. It's nice to be back, he said, and somehow, he honestly meant it. This was a good place. Flynn and Sari were good people. Somehow, it almost didn't feel real. In the store, things like rifts, rebellions, slayers and monsters seemed so far away. Master Armsfield, I h hope you'll find everything has been done to your satisfaction while you were away Flynn stammered, twisting his hands together. Tyron wiped the scowl off his face, before the young man could realize it was there. Relax, Flynn, I only just got back. I'll take a day or two to inspect the books and go through the inventory. I'm sure you've done an excellent job. He could practically feel magic leaking from less than flawless conduits in the enchanted goods around him. Don't let it bother you. He did the best he could. For a few hours, he busied himself with the matters of the shop. He and Sari went through the accounts line by line, and there were pleasingly few errors in the calculations. Business had continued to be strong. The appetite for his cheap but effective enchantments had grown, if anything. Well done, Sari he congratulated her, and she grinned. Following that, he and a still nervous Flynn went through the inventory, item by item as he inspected the engraving on each and every one. All in all, his apprentice had done better than he'd expected. Clearly, there had been a breakthrough in his skills for such an improvement to be evident. It was a cause for celebration. You've come a long way. Flynn Tyron didn't hesitate to praise the young man. You'll be receiving a bonus for your work this past month. Master Armsfield, that's not necessary. Practically glowing with pride, Flynn tried to refuse. But Tyron insisted. Good work deserved reward. By the end of the day, everything was in order and he retired to his chambers, throwing himself, finally, into his own, comfortable bed. He didn't even need to cast the spell. Sleep rose to take him of its own volition for once, the incessant buzzing of his mind not strong enough to resist its pull. In the morning, it would start again. The study in the cellar needed his attention. He had learned so much, tested his ideas, gained a great deal of knowledge and uncovered new avenues of inquiry. It was also time for the status ritual to be performed once more. Time to tally up the full account of what he had gained. Chapter 175 It wouldn't do to disappear into the cellar for an extended period immediately after he arrived, so Tyron forced himself to postpone. Instead, he got to work ensuring the store was well stocked and supplied. Which meant he had to take the time needed to go through Flynn's work, and correct his mistakes. You haven't properly accounted for the shape of the core, he said, indicating the malformed rune. As a consequence, the matrix isn't functioning properly. There's leakage. I'm sorry, Master Armsfield. His apprentice wore a hangdog expression, as if he were being scolded. I am not criticizing. This is instruction. This is the only store in the province which makes such extensive use of low-grade cores, and I'm perfectly aware just how difficult it is. Engraving sigils onto the uneven surface of only partially formed calls added a layer of difficulty to an already complex process. It was a skill Tyron had cultivated over thousands of hours of practice, but not one most high-end arcanists would ever make use of. If a call wasn't a well-formed sphere, they would reject them out of hand. If you can do this well, you can purchase cores rejected by other enchanting workshops at a massive discount, even though they're only a few percent less effective. 
You always think about the bottom line, Master Armsfield. That made him sound like he was some sort of penny pincher. It's about being efficient, he frowned. There is no reason to use a core any larger than is necessary for the work. This was something Master Willem lectured his students on frequently. Although the master was a penny pincher who hated wasting good calls on bad students, Tyron had taken the lesson to heart. His personal focus had been achieving close to lossless conduits to squeeze every drop of power he could out of himself, and the cores he used to fuel more and better minions. So there was overlap. Of course Flynn hastened to agree. Even with higher grade cores, Arcanists will reject any that are too uneven. Cores naturally form a spherical shape, but you'll pay ten times the price for a perfectly smooth one. Tyron shook his head. You'll never see one of those cores in this shop, I assure you. Working around uneven surfaces is a necessary skill. He took apart much of the merchandise on the shop floor, reworking the cores and correcting the flaws, or throwing them out and enchanting new ones from scratch. By the time it was done, Flynn looked as though he'd been dragged over hot coals. But Tyron didn't really understand why. As far as he was concerned, he delivered a thorough and detail-rich lesson that his apprentice sorely needed. After all, the time to consolidate the basics was after every qualitative leap in skill. Basics, basics, basics. It was the mantra of Master Willem, and Tyron saw no reason to disagree with the man. It resonated heavily with how Magnan and Beery had approached their professions. When all was said and done, it was late afternoon, and he sent his apprentice home early, asked Seri to handle the store closing with Wansa, who remained on duty by the door, then slipped into the spare room. He undid his enchantments, went through the hidden passage and down the stairs, before he found himself safely ensconced once again within his study. He took a deep breath of the stagnant air, before a soft smile settled on his lips as he began to unpack his things. Ordering his books, sorting through his notes, making neater copies of the mad scrawl he'd generated, all of it would take days and nights to complete. For now, he created several neat stacks for himself to look over later, before he found a clean, blank sheet of paper, and placed it carefully in the center of the table. I'd better be level 45 at least he murmured. He knew that leveling speed dove off a cliff once a slayer reached silver rank, and somehow found another cliff to dive off at gold. But after all that he'd done, surely he had enough. The real limiting factor was the weak kin which emerged from the Kragwasaur Rift. It was common knowledge that stronger kin meant greater reward, not just financially in the form of calls, but from the unseen. This was the reason Magnan and Beery had been able to continue fighting despite being banned from growing any further. Without passing through the most dangerous rifts and battling the terrors only found on the other side, there was nothing they could fight, which would allow them to progress. It must have been so galling for them. Enough stalling, Tyron. It is what it is. Pushing all the distractions from his mind, he sliced a small cut in the meat of his thumb, and pressed it to the page. He spoke the ritual and watched as the red letters formed, staining the white paper with a record of his achievements. His proficiency had increased in a long list of skills, spells and rituals, but he only glossed over those. The real meat came with the class notifications. You have raised skeletons and they have fought on your behalf. Lord of the Oswari has reached level 45. You have received plus 6 strength, plus 9 constitution, plus 9 intelligence, plus 6 wisdom, plus 6 willpower, plus 6 manipulation and plus 9 poise. You grow close to the point your patrons will be able to call in their debts. Soon, you will be useful to them. Make ready, and await the call. Forbidden One has reached level 27. You have received plus 2 manipulation, plus 4 constitution, plus 4 intelligence, plus 4 willpower and plus 2 poise. Name. Tyron Steelum. Age. 23. Race. Human. Level 20. Class. Lord of the Oswari. Level 45. Subclasses. Forbidden 1, level 27. Focused Enchanter, level 40. None. Racial Feats, level 5. Steady Hand, level 10. Night Owl. Feat Selections Available, 2. Attributes, Strength, 72. Dexterity, 129. Constitution, 171. Intelligence, 293. Wisdom, 196. Willpower, 150. Charisma, 66. Manipulation, 96. Poise, 105. General Skills. Arithmetic, level 5 right parenthesis max. 
Handwriting, level 5 right parenthesis max. If you encounter this story on Amazon, note that it's taken without permission from the author. Report it. Concentration, level 5 right parenthesis max. Cooking, level 4. Sling, level 3. Swordsmanship, level 2. Sneak, level 3. Butchery, level 5 right parenthesis max. Engraving, level 5 right parenthesis max. Skill selections available. 5. Necromancer skills. Corpse appraisal, level 20 right parenthesis max. Corpse preparation, level 20 right parenthesis max. Advanced death magic, level 20 right parenthesis max. Enhanced minion commander, level 11. Undead control, level 10 right parenthesis max. Minion modification, level 9. Bone soul melding, level 10. Death infusion, level 4. Bone forging, level 12. Anathema skills. Abyss Tongue, level 4. Spell Concealment, level 10 right parenthesis max. Arcanist Skills. Expert Magic Scripting, level 30 right parenthesis max. Channeling, level 10 right parenthesis max. Pliance Control, level 10 right parenthesis max. Expanded Sigil Formation, level 16. Core Linking, level 10 right parenthesis max. Advanced Fine Motor Control, level 16. Expert Network Formation, level 27. Advanced Conduit Magic, level 20 right parenthesis max. Advanced Core Sense, level 16. Expert Power Control, level 26. General Spells. Globe of Light, level 5 right parenthesis max. Sleep, level 5 right parenthesis max. Magic Bolt, level 5 right parenthesis max. Magic Eye, level 5 right parenthesis max. Necromancer Spells. Raise Dead, level 33. Bone Animus, level 25. Commune with Spirits, level 10 right parenthesis max. Shivering Curse, level 8. Death Blades, level 8. Empowered Bone Armor, level 6. Minion Sight, level 10 right parenthesis max. Spirit Binding, level 10 right parenthesis max. Death's Grasp, level 5. Anoint Dead, level 5. Black Miasma, level 3. Death Bolt, level 6. Summon the Oswari, level 2. Anathema Spells. Pierce the Veil, level 8. Appeal to the Court, level 4. Dark Communion, level 1. Advanced Suppress Mind, level 19. Repository, level 8. Fear, level 3. Glamour, level 10 right parenthesis max. Invasive Persuasion, level 10 right parenthesis max. Crone's Shade, level 5. Bewitch, level 10 right parenthesis max. Necromancer Feats. Skeleton Focus 3. Magic Battery 2. Bone Mastery. Spirit Mastery. Undead Specialist. Anathema Feats. Repository. Wall of Thought 2. Drain Life. Stormwise. Arcanus Feats. Magic Thread Control 2. Compact Sigils 2. Conduit Seal 2. Core Networking 2. Mysteries. Spell Shaping Advanced. Int plus 20. Wiss plus 20. Words of Power Advanced. Wiss plus 20. Char plus 20. Essence of Death. Int plus 3. Will plus 3. Soul Magic. Wiss plus 3. Char plus 3. Lord of the Oswari has reached level 45. Choose an additional feat. Oswari Extraction I increase the amount of death magic available to the Oswari. Oswari Expansion I increase the size of the Oswari. Oswari Infusion I increase the efficacy of the bone receptacles. Awaken the ore to allow the altar to be utilized in the creation of undead. Class Focus I choose two class skills or spells and raise their cap by 10. Skeleton Focus IV, improve the quality of raised skeletons. Bone Mastery 2, empower all bone-related skills, spells and minions. Half Dead, allow your own bones to be infused with death magic. Bone Sculptor, improve your ability to mold and shape bone. Bone Animator, empower your constructs. Lord of the Oswari has reached level 44. Choose one additional skill or spell. Spells. Bone Lance, extend a spear of hardened bone. Skeletal Sacrifice Detonante a skeleton to shower your foe in shards of bone. Forbidden One has reached level 26. Choose an additional skill or spell. Skills. Corrupting Presence subvert the will to resist from those around you. Spells. Advanced Invasive Persuasion replace Invasive Persuasion and increase the maximum level by 10. Advanced Bewitch replace Bewitch and increase the maximum level by 10. 
Blood Shield draw essence from your opponents to form a protective barrier. You have qualified for a new subclass. Death Mage. Do you accept? There was much that pleased Tyron about his updated status. His control over his minions had substantially improved after a month of remotely directing battles on the mountain. He continued to make gains in his fundamental skills, which was always a priority. He'd even improved a few of his enchanting skills, which was a nice surprise. Sometimes, working on something new was worth a hundred times the progression that grinding away on the same old patterns would provide. Other things, he was a little disappointed over. Despite everything, he'd hoped to get more than just three levels after all the fighting he'd done. It seemed, if he really wanted to progress using the Kragwasol Rift, he would need to spend more time through the Rift hunting for powerful kin. At least he'd reached his goal and gotten a look at the feat list for Lord of the Oswari. A few things caught his eye immediately. Three separate, multi-level feats that empowered the space itself rather than him. This was unusual but not unheard of. Even his father had possessed some abilities that strengthened whatever blade he had in his hand. If he thought of the Oswari as a tool, then it made a little more sense. A second level in bone mastery was beyond tempting. He used bones for everything at this point, and this feat caught all of that, giving another boost from the unseen. The next level of skeleton focus had appeared, as he'd suspected it might. Currently, he had skeleton focus 3. And that number, odd, was displeasing in the extreme. Class focus was not to be looked down on either. He could pick any of his class abilities, and raise the maximum level of two of them by ten. That was enormous, and could be a considerable boost if he were to make the right choices. Then there was the altar that intrigued him greatly. The lack of information provided was extremely grating, as usual. But he was almost overcome with curiosity. He'd inspected that altar minutely, using every trick at his disposal to determine if there was something he could do with it. And he'd come up with nothing. This feat would enable something. It would be a risk to choose it. But could he afford to pass it up? Other feats relating to bone constructs were also intriguing, though one of them sparked a thought. Bone Sculptor. Tyron had experienced difficulty when shaping bone from the very beginning, and though he'd gotten better, it was still hard. If sculpting would improve it, he had selections to burn anyway. So Tyron decided to use a general skill slot and wrote sculpting in his own blood on the sheet. With any luck, proficiency with the general skill would help him shape bone as well. The spell and skill selections were a little more straightforward. At least he'd been offered two this time. Bone Spear was the clear favorite in Tyron's mind. Sure, there would doubtless be times when shattering one of his own minions would be the correct tactical decision. But Tyron hated the thought of wasting his time and effort. His skeletons were to be masterworks, not cannon fodder. Masterwork cannon fodder, at the very least. After contemplating, Tyron shook his head and committed, placing a bloody thumbprint next to awaken the altar and bone lance. Turning his attention to the next set of abilities his subclass provided, Tyron could only grimace. Anathema and Forbidden One only seemed to offer him things that he found distasteful even if they later proved to be useful. Advanced Invasive Persuasion was the clear standout, in his opinion. He'd never wanted to use the ability in the first place. But now he was turning it against the Magisters themselves. He would need all the proficiency he could get. Then he came to the last puzzling notification. He had qualified for a new subclass, seemingly by training himself. This was unusual, though not unheard of. Normally, one gained proficiency by working with an expert, or someone who already possessed the class. With that guidance, it was much easier to reach a level of skill or ability that the Unseen was prepared to acknowledge. It had taken Tyron a few weeks working under Master Willem, before he'd been able to accept the Enchanter subclass. Though that had been more than a month faster than any of the other apprentices who'd joined at the same time. Apparently, he'd now worked enough death magic spells that the Unseen considered him qualified to take up the mantle of Death Mage, and Tyron wasn't sure how he felt about it. He'd never made a firm decision as to what his final subclass would be, and now one had been thrown at him out of the blue. In reality, there wasn't really any reason to refuse it. He could abandon the class at any time, if he wanted to take up another. So he marked his acceptance with a trace of reluctance. The status ritual was complete, and the moment Tyron ended it, his eyes rolled back as a wave of information pounded into his brain. You have received the subclass, Death Mage. 
Just as there is energy and power in life, the same exists within death. You have taken steps along this path and shall now reap the benefit. Use your abilities to spread death and reap your harvest. Class attributes per level. Constitution plus one. Willpower plus one. Poise plus one. Skills granted level one. None. Spells granted level one. None. This is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed. It looks like we are near the end of Tyron's adventure. We will need to wait a bit for more chapters to come out. I would like to come back to this story in the future. But we need to be patient. I would really appreciate a coffee from you, if possible. If not possible, don't sweat it. Also, thank you for your kind comments. Have a wonderful rest of the day. The silent rupt is out.